All right, part eight. Hello, welcome once again to this thing. <laughs> Me doing some live coding. Uh, I am uh, writing a WebAssembly interpreter in Ruby. Um, I'm doing this to have fun, mainly. Also to demystify WebAssembly a bit for myself and maybe for you. Uh, and also to share how I go about it. I'm using the executable specifications of WebAssembly to kind of drive out my implementation. So far, that's working okay. So it's not a disaster. Um, we'll see where we end up. Um, uh, this is just a reminder for myself that it's more important for me to have fun doing this than for the implementation to actually be functional or, you know, to uh, ever be able to execute any WebAssembly. It doesn't bother me really. I just want to see how far I can get and enjoy myself. Um, it's not important whether it's fast. I just want the code that I do manage to write to actually be correct and to do the right thing. Uh, it's more important that the code I write is, is clear um, and could potentially be useful to someone else who wants to either learn from me writing it or learn from reading it uh, when it goes up on GitHub. Um, so it's more important that it's uh, that it has some clarity than that it's especially clever code. Um, I'm trying to stick to doing it in pure Ruby and to not have any dependencies, which is kind of, which has become kind of interesting because that's meant that I've had to do things like, uh, well, in the last stream, well, I was going to talk about this in the retro. I'll talk about what happened on the last stream. Um, so what happened was my pure Ruby encoding and decoding of IEEE 754 floating point numbers actually kind of works. It looks like it works. It's all correct. The tests are passing. Um, so that's exciting. I wasn't at all sure that I was going to get to that point. Now, um, Obviously, I haven't implemented any actual operations on them yet beyond the ability to convert them into, well, other sizes of float and integers in and vice versa in various different ways. Um, but I do feel confident that the worst part is now over. You know, this was the bit I was really worried about was any sort of impedance mismatch between the way that Ruby represented particularly 32-bit floats, given that Ruby doesn't have 32-bit floats, only 64-bit ones, um, and the expectations of WebAssembly. And I sort of feel like I've dealt with that mismatch now. Um, so I'm relatively relaxed about that. Um, so that's the good news, I suppose. Um, the bad news is that is the, the mess I created <laughs> um, while getting to that point is almost unbearable. Um, there's there's copied and pasted code, variables and methods have got the wrong names, they're in the wrong places in some cases. It's basically, a, it's, from a software engineering perspective, it's a disaster. So now that the tests are passing, I'm going to take this opportunity to just kind of take a breath and tidy up again, which I did in, a, in, an, in an earlier uh, part. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing this time. And I'm going to get stuck into that right now. So mess, let's get rid of mess. Um, so where we had got to is that all of the tests, including this is, and it's not very clear, but these were the conversions.wast tests. Uh, let me see if I can open that up. Uh, there we go. WebAssembly spec core. Oh, no, that's the wrong, sorry, that's the wrong URL. It's GitHub uh, core. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, conversions. So these are all passing. Um, like I said, these are mostly about these instructions like i64 extend, i60, i32 trunk, trunk sat, convert, promote, demote, reinterpret. So in fact, those are all of the instructions that we've needed to implement. It's just that there have been a huge number of different edge cases that are being provoked by these, um, by these tests. Um, so yeah, I'm now fairly confident that everything I've implemented so far 
is right. Um, I spent a bit of time thinking about, like, just looking at the code and thinking about, like, what would I like to improve? Um, so here are some things that I'd like to improve. Uh, I broke out... This, this to-do list was getting really long. And actually, maybe I should just... Maybe I'll just get rid of... There's a temptation to keep all of the all of the things that are already done because it feels like a lovely trophy of, you know, the heads of all the beasts that I've slain, but actually it's now just getting in the way. So uh, maybe there's a way to configure Apple Notes to just hide those, but if there is, I don't know what it is. Um, so these were sort of general, um, well, maybe this belongs in here. I was trying to separate out kind of like just general stuff, um, things that have come up, whether these are like uh, essentially feature requests or mysteries or whatever. So these are my sort of generic to do's. And then I've tried to break out of the ones that I already had, I've tried to break out the ones that I consider to be, you know, essentially to do with refactoring the, the sort of main. I mean, at the moment, this worst minute.rb is just the main interpreter file um so some of these are old ones the renames and stuff um but i've added some more things in here i've said i wanted to use uh this was a float class um at the moment i think we introduced it in order to yeah to make this I can't remember which one it was that provoked this, but one of these instructions uh, wasn't working right with just packing and unpacking things uh, using Ruby. And so we've sort of um, degenerated into implementing it ourselves. Um, so that's done, but there are various, this is the only place it's used where, and in this file, there's actually tons of, not least in this interpret float, um, there's lots of packing and unpacking, but also in these other float instructions. And I suspect that we've done all of the work necessary to be able to just replace these with, you know, create a Wasmina float and then encode it at this precision or something. So I think probably all of these can be, you know, can be replaced. And that would, I'm interested in doing that, not just to clean up this code. I mean, that's the main reason, but also because this would, this would essentially get more test coverage of the float implementation because this is like several more places where we could hook into it. So that's something I quite like to do. Um, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to talk through all of these because if, as I do them, we'll have to talk about them. But, you know, I thought some other ideas, move some methods around. Um, oh, these are some these are some old things that were just things that I wanted to do already in this wasmino.rb, so I've put them in that section. Um, this is almost entirely new stuff here in refactoring float.rb. Um, a couple of things from that I wrote last time, um, but mainly, like, all of this is new stuff. Um, I, looking at this float.rb file, I get quite a strong sense that a lot of the complexity in it is incidental and that just with a bit of reorganization it can be made more compact and easier to read and just generally clearer and i mean hopefully more obviously correct assuming it is correct i want that to be obvious and at the moment is not necessarily but i think that's because its correctness is being obscured by just poor organization of code or poor naming of things or whatever so i think this is where i really want to focus my attention uh, during this session because, well, frankly, this is the bit of code that I'm most interested in at the moment. This is definitely the piece of this that I'm the most proud of at the moment. I mean, the, you know, the fact that I wrote an S expression parser or whatever is sort of more tragic than anything else. But with this, I'm quite pleased that something I've just hacked together actually does what it's supposed to do. And it would be even better if it did it in a way that was, you know, clear and correct and nicely organized and stuff so I, I feel sort of emotionally invested in getting this code uh, sorted out so yeah I won't go through all of this but there's this is mainly for me you know having read through this code earlier I, I wanted to have something to look at to sort of remind me of like what I thought it might benefit from 
Um, so I think I'm just going to start chipping away at this. Um, although I'm not sure this isn't, this list of refactorings is not in any kind of order. So at the moment I'm just sort of, I'm just scrolling through and <laughs> looking for anything that, uh, I find especially offensive, but really this whole thing has got the feeling of being a little bit, a little bit arbitrary. Um, yeah, I mean, we have at least got these separate, well, we've got one big decode method here. I guess that's where the meat of it is going on, is sort of the decode method and then these three encode methods of which the one for finite numbers is the most complicated. So I think that's where I want to focus my attention. I think the most complicated thing is this encode method for finite. So I would like to pick on that a bit. Um, you know, things like these and... Um, yeah, lots of... I think the the thing I most dislike about this code, uh, ignoring the sort of copied and pasted stuff that's obviously problematic, um, one of the things I most dislike is that there are lots of sort of bitwise expressions that crop up all over the place. Um, I mean, in some cases, like here, it's at least labeled with a local variable, so you know what it's supposed to represent. But there are other places where there's just these sort of inline things like this. Um, you know, like, what's this? Uh, and I think the code would be a lot easier to read if I could sort of reduce its dependence on, on that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I can see a bunch of stuff that's been copied and pasted, so I want to deal with that. So like this here, like, what's this one shifted left exponent bits minus one? When I wrote that, I knew what that was. Um, I'm sure I could recreate that understanding by thinking about it for five seconds, but just at a glance, it's not at all obvious what that is. Um, well, I mean, here's one little thing that's annoying. I don't like... Oops. Um, I don't like this. Oh, what is wrong with me? Um, I don't like the, this repeated assignment inside a conditional, so I'm just going <laughs> to... That's a nice gentle thing to get started with is just lift that um, out of the conditional. Uh, I guess these need to be arrays now. That's just a, this is just a warm up. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let's say lift numerator and denominator assignment out of conditional. So I think I'm, <laughs> I think maybe this exemplifies what is likely to happen here is that I'm just going to, I'm just going to pick away at the corpse of this and, you know, see what I can find. Um, yeah, Chris is saying, is there a bit string concept that you could extract that you could use to store each of the component parts of the float and have common bit twiddling operations on them? Yes, absolutely. And that's that's sort of what this was intended to be, this to-do list item that says extract. I, I, I called it format. I don't know if that's the right name for it. But the idea of taking these... I mean, let's let's take a look at that now. I mean, it's as good a thing to do as any, you know, that was motivated primarily by the fact that these all get copied in here. But I think you're right about the bit twiddling stuff. I mean, that's kind of what I was suggesting with the parenthetical here, saying maybe with, I don't know whether pack and unpack are the right method names, that might be misleading. But something for sort of, basically for this to encapsulate both the, this is why I called it format, because it sort of, it knows the parameters of the encoding, and it could also be the thing that's responsible for sort of, I don't know what the right verb is, like serializing and deserializing the encoding and taking the, the bit fields in and out of it. I mean, maybe you're talking about the, um, talking about something more general than that and saying like, we should just have a data type that's, that's for rem representing sort of bit strings in general and that has nice named methods called like mask and stuff like that to sort of, twiddle the bits um 
and I suppose that's a lower level concept than what I'm talking about here. Uh, but I think it would be interesting to see, I think if I start pulling on this thread, it'll be interesting to see where that goes because uh, I feel a bit torn between on the one hand, it, I, I really like the idea of, I don't, I don't know if that's what you were necessarily suggesting, but I, I really like the idea of having a sort of low level representation of a concept almost just for its own sake uh in this case we only really need to use it in one place if if we can encapsulate all of the twiddling into um a class that understands the format of the flow then that would sort of be the only client of that bit field um although maybe not maybe in the rest of the interpreter there's all sorts of bit twiddling but well why don't i start pulling on this I'll start pulling on this specific thread. Um, like I say, it's as good a place to start as any and see where that takes us. Um, so what would that look like? If I make a class called format, I'm not, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's the right name. Um, but I'll, I'll do for now. I, I did think about calling it precision, but I think maybe if it does represent not only the precision, but also it's got this sort of the ability to serialize and deserialize that specific, you know, single precision or half or double or whatever. I quite like the idea of calling it something like format. So actually I think this should be a struct um, and it should, you know, essentially it's gonna, we're gonna have some some semblance of this stuff in it, I think. Um, so I think it needs exponent bits and it needs significant bits, uh, keyword in it true. Um, what, why did I do that? Um, in fact, am I going to want to, I think I want this to be a, cl I think I want this because I think I want to put some constants inside here. Um, not least, I would like to make a sort of a single precision and a double precision instance of this. Well, I mean, I guess I might as well just do this cause it's, it's this. Um, so this would be new exponent bits is eight and significant bits is 24 and double would be new exponent bits 11 significant bits 53 um, and I think that when you I think if you do this foo equals struct new bar and then in oh that's not what I wanted to do at all um do and then inside here you say like baz is hello i don't think that there's any namespace there i think baz is just a top level constant because it wasn't inside you know a class or syntactically inside a class or a module so although i do usually prefer just i prefer not doing the subclassing here in this case it's actually kind of it's actually kind of handy because i get this namespace um well, I don't know that I'm going to need these, but it seems, well, I am. If, if, if I'm going to remove like all of these lines of code, I assume the exponent bias and fraction bits are needed down there. Um, the only, my only hesitation is, is are they used by code that is ultimately going to be moved into here? Like I can imagine some of the code inside this decode thing here could, um, comprise part of a, an unpack method on this format class and so I don't know whether I don't know whether the clients of this code are actually gonna they might move into this class I guess we'll still need the methods anyway so or you know it might it would be nice to have them okay um so that's some of those. Um, this thing is going to need to say, uh, you know, format equals, you know, bits is 
thirty two well let's let's have a sort of have a sort of factory that can be used to pull that out. Um how's that going to work? Uh four bits. Um Well, this comes back to a Fuchs point actually about, because, sorry, the thing I'm thinking is I don't actually know, well, superficially, I don't know which one of these to pick for programmatically, which one to pick for 32 bits or 64 bits. But of course I do. Um, where was the? Oh, yeah, this thing that a Fuchs said on Tuesday about just compute exponent bits from significant bits or vice versa. The point he was making is that these are not three independent parameters there. <laughs> In fact, because al al although the float, the, although the format consists of a sign bit, an, ex an exponent and a fraction, um, we tend to, I guess conventionally, you tend to specify the precision of the significant, which is one more than the fraction. So actually, what I'm saying is a long-winded way of saying that you can get the width of this by just adding these two things together. So if I uh, if I just put these in an array, how do you how do you finish an array? Not like that. So if I put those in an array, then this can just do all um, detect. Uh, format, format, exponent bits plus, oh, this line's going to get really long. Um, oh, not, not bias, bits. Uh, let's just make this short for a sec. F exponent bits plus F significant bits equals bits. So that's gonna, that's just gonna pick the one <laughs> whose total width, I mean, I guess, you know, I could put an instance method on it that, that computes this. Um, maybe I will do that. So let's just say, that will make the line shorter. Um, so if I say, uh, well, it's, it's this, isn't it? Oh, I just type it. Exponent bits plus significant bits. So that's the total bit width. Um, so now I think it's nicer to... Uh, this can just be format.bits is equal to bits. Um, didn't I have in uh, interpret, the increasingly badly named interpret float, there's this raise unsupported float width. So I think I'm going to sort of copy that and put that here uh, so that I think that's probably just a little bit nicer than returning nil if this isn't found. Um, so, um, so what I'm trying to do here is get to the point where I can try running this code and check I haven't broke anything because it's been a long time. So let's do the exponent bits equals format dot exponent bits so i'm just i'm just going to try and shim this and define all these locals but then i think they it can probably be they can probably be inlined all over the place um i just want to see the code work uh exponent bias is equal to format exponent bias and fraction bits is equal to format dot fraction bits. So uh, that was not successful. Um, so I can try running this now. Um, let's try running just that conversions because that's faster. Okay, well I've got a syntax error. 194. Oh, well that means I've missed I've missed an end somewhere or, you know, a closing bracket or something. 
Uh, what have I done wrong? What the hell was it like that? Okay, well, yeah, that's not helpful, is it? Um, that looks okay. I think this is okay. Um, well, I'm afraid I'm going to resort to just commenting out this whole thing and seeing whether that makes the syntax error go away. Yeah, it does. Okay, so where where have I screwed up here? Oh. Oh, I've put do on the end. That's not how... That's not how classes work, is it? It's, you know, because I first in, I initially wrote this not with the class keyword, and then I just forgot to remove it. Silly mistake. Could have happened to anyone. Okay, so that's all working, um, but this is not really the intermediate situation that I want to leave it in. Um, I would really rather find all the places where this is used. Um, yeah, I think I will do that. So where it says exponent bits, make that format exponent bits. Um, and then same for, where does it use significant bits? Oh, it actually doesn't. It just uses that to calculate the fraction bits. Okay, well, that was easy. Uh, exponent bias. Uh, format dot exponent bias. I can see that that fraction bits is going to be, well, yeah, okay, let's do this. Uh, format dot fraction bits. This is format dot fraction bits. This is format dot fraction bits. Um, any more? Yes, here. I missed one. Okay, so that is, I think, semi-convincing. Um, can I, is it safe for me to make that method protected or does it, does life not work that way? No, because I think the, yeah, never mind. It's only it's only really needed in this factory, but I suppose there's no harm in in exposing that. Um, okay, so I've got I've extracted my format class. Um, I think maybe what I'm going to do some to do list item inflation. Um, give format. E.g. pattern compact. So, um, yeah, I just want to I just want to do this extraction. Um, so that we're not duplicating that code all over the place because this was this stuff literally was just copied and pasted um, so if i can just fix these up then at the very least i'm not duplicating these magic um these magic numbers all over the place Are we still good? Yep. Okay, and then there should just be one more of these. This is probably the worst one. Um, oh, so here we do need the significant bits. Uh, we need the exponent bias. Uh, although <laughs> I can see that these are a very tempting because these are these are more properties of the of the format the this is an extremely tempting target to just move into that format but let's take it one take it one thing at a time um, so what else in here uh, yeah 
exponent significant. Oh, I got fraction bits here. Um, here, here, here. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, well that feels like, I know that's actually quite meaty, but I think I'm just gonna make that commit and say, I've extracted this thing. Um, well, I thought I'd extracted all of the stuff that belonged in it, but I can see that there's maybe some more stuff that should go into it, but this is more than enough to be getting started with. I guess maybe for purism's sake, is that a word? I could have left the exponent bias and the fraction bits um, behind and then moved them in, but they were right next to it in the code. So, um, so let's say uh, extract wasmina float format class uh, and let's say this class represents the the information represents the knowledge we have about the format of 16 and 32 bit IEEE 754 floating point numbers i.e. the sizes of their exponents and significance. Um, this was previously repeated in several methods and is now consolidated in one place. Um, I extracted exponent bias and fraction bits at the same time because they lived directly next to the code that determined the exponent and significant widths. Um, but um, they're arguably less important since the caller could compute them if it wanted to from the other information if it wanted to. Right, so um, I think I, w I think I am going to move these other things. Um, it's actually something else that bothers me about this, and I, I wrote this. Well, so I did extract a class uh, to store the format parameters. Um, I said here, introduce exponent quotient ranges. It kind of made me a bit sad that these exponents and significance like it's really quite clunky to be passing pairs of them around and conceptually what they are is a, is a range of valid values <laughs> um so actually i think i think what i'm going to do is clean that up locally here and then i think i could extract the construction of these into the format. So let's do that. Um, so what does this call them? Min significant, max, min max. I mean, I, I think what I'm going to do is just replace this min and max significant with a range and just call it significance like this. And it's not very beautiful. Th this expression will get shorter. You can see there's some sort of feature envy going on here where really this is just using information from the format. So I think that is, that's quite a clear smell <laughs> that this code doesn't really belong here, but um, it's fine here for the moment while we do this refactoring. So if I say that these are the these do essentially go with the format, don't they? These are the these are the significance and the exponents that the format is able to express. That's basically what we're saying here. Um, uh, 
I'm just pausing because that's not quite true here. Um, because we designed these min and max exponents to be off by one. Uh, let me just see through the thing that I'm doing here and then we need to think about that separately because the reason why the reason why we did that was because the actual minimum exponent is special and the actual maximum exponent is special. So this is sort of a... We sort of want those to stay reserved, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I can just see that this is going to be a problem when we extract these into the format. But for now, I'll just do this. And then at least we'll have plugged ranges through. They'll be plumbed through. And then if I have to modify one of these ranges, um, then I think that's okay. Uh, so those are ranges now. So we're, I'm just going to search for max underscore and that'll show me all the places that this... So this got... Well, maybe min underscore is more helpful because that is the first one. Um, so here, I just I'm just going to pass through the significands instead of uh, min and max, and here I'm just going to pass through exponents. Um, Same thing is necessary here. Um, same here. So I think that's all of the, oh, we've got more here, okay. Oh, so this is only Uh, I think I'm going to have to do that. Yeah, okay. I mean, ultimately, I think that's where I was going with having these be ranges, is that a range really just packages up a minimum and a maximum. And you can use begin and end, but as long as they're numbers... <laughs> Um, min and max, I think, just do the same thing. It's not like it's going to iterate over every element of the range and try to find the minimum. It's just going to, I think, min is just essentially a synonym for begin if you've got a numeric range. Um, so now I just have to change this. Uh, and this is exponents uh, so I was just thinking about if there's a nice way of doing this but I don't think there is I think we're just gonna have to oh I uh, hold on min min max max it's just confusing because one of them's comparing one of them's less than and the other one's greater than but that is correct okay let's get all the variable names right um Um, yeah, 
actually there is something slightly nicer I can do there but let's just run it and see what happens okay so that's all fine um, I think I'm just going to do this as part of this change what I really care about here like the reason why I'm testing whether exponent is greater than exponents.min is that I want to make sure that when I do this when I decrement the exponent it stays within the range of valid exponents but I think it's better to just ask that question directly um, which I can do with range include well why don't I commit this and then I can so here let's say um, use ranges for uh, yeah for valid significands and exponents and I'm just going to say uh, so rather than passing uh, min and max values around separately we can just pass a single range which is neater and provides uh, the opportunity to use some of the range operations which we will do in the next commit because the next thing I want to do is just change this code so that rather than doing this comparison it asks whether exponents includes exponent minus one because if it does then it's safe to decrement it and likewise I want to know if exponents includes exponent plus one then it's okay to add one to it okay so this is going to be uh, use range include to check uh, exponent uh, to keep exponent in range use the right word range uh, intentionally there but that'll do okay so let's introduce these um, now that I've done that I think it's made it more obvious that these positional arguments are not in the right order like numerator denominator and exponent actually mentioned here that, that those three things like travel around together um, the significance and the exponents are like not as fundamental to what this method does as the numerator denominator and exponent like essentially what this method does is you give it a numerator denominator and an exponent and then it gives you those back having scaled them so I'm just going to reorder this um, like that uh, who calls this uh, here and here uh, I think that's it uh, <laughs> uh, okay why, why did I do that How on earth did that happen? Oh well. Obviously I pressed the wrong button on the computer. Okay. So this is gonna be uh, reorder scale significant arguments. And I'm just going to say um, this communicates that the numerator denominator and exponent are more important than the other two arguments. Okay, now I put a thing here saying Rename scale significant to st scale quotient.
Oh, yeah, right. Well, I understand why I've said that. And that's because this method is not really about significance at all. Like, that's what I think that's what, what bugs me when I was looking at this is that now that this method has been extracted from the context where it originally existed, where it's all to do with significance, um, it's not really, this, this thing is not really anything to do specifically with flows. This is just a generic operation that if you give it a rational number, and some, I mean, this isn't necessarily a base two exponent, um, it will adjust the quotient of that, uh, you know, the integer result of dividing the numerator by the denominator, it will adjust that. Um, until it's within that range. So I think that's right. I think this scale significant should really be called scale quotient. And I think everything in here that's talking about significance should be talking about quotients. Um, I failed to do that correctly. Uh, do I need to do this? Can I just not remember how Vim works? Yeah, I think I think I just don't remember how this works. Okay, um, okay, so that you do not put a percent sign <laughs> when you're inside a visual selection, which feels like the kind of thing I should know after um, many years of using Vim, but apparently my muscle memory doesn't know that. Okay, so I think this n now, my concern was that I wanted this method to make sense in isolation, which I think that it now does. So scale the quotient up and down until it's in range and adjust the exponent to account for scaling. Um, and that's what it does. And the fact that this uh, is going to be used to compute the significant of a float is sort of not relevant to the job that that method is doing, I, I would say. Oh, because I renamed the method. Okay. So let's say um, rename scale significance, uh, significance to scale quotient. And I will say um, the method itself is not really anything to do with floating point numbers despite being used to calculate the significant. So we can give it a more intention revealing name to highlight the fact that it's just manipulating a rational number. Okay, so that was that one. Um, I feel like I was, I had an intention here to pull out these into the format, but I haven't done it. Um, I think I'm going to do that next. Um, so let's pull these out. Um, maybe I can just move that whole chunk out. Um, so put those into the format. So that's, that's put them in the format. Um, now there's going to be a load of broken code that's expecting 
Well, where is that broken code? Yes. So this is going to be like format.significans, format.exponents. And then we're going to get more of that, more of that business. Oh, yes, I forgot to. That's better. Uh, right. Where's that? Right. Okay, is that all of it? Yes. Okay, so like I said, I just feel slightly nervous about the fact that it's uh, that I know that it's not the right. trying to think what to do about the fact that I know that that range for the exponent is not it's not actually the right one um, Maybe I'll come back to that. I'm going to say, like, fix the fix format exponents to actually return the full range of exponents. Because right now it isn't. And I'm, for some reason, my brain is getting a bit fixated on that. Um, but it doesn't really matter at this point. I just don't want to leave it like that. Um, but I'll make sure I come back to that. So this was um, extract significance and exponents into format. Um, so I'm going to say I'm a little concerned that exponents doesn't actually return the full range of exponents only those usable for normal numbers i.e. not infinity nan or subnormal well zero or subnormal but we're only using it in one place right now so I can afford to come and fix it later rather than deal with it immediately. Okay. Um, so I've got a thing here that says extract round quotient and extract a method to do both scaling and rounding. So I think I was, when I was reading through this code, it sort of bothered me that Well, basically, that this encode method was so long was the thing that bothered me. Um, actually, I already, last time I, I had a complaint about this as well. Not a complaint exactly, but I remember that this was put in as sort of a placeholder because this was introduced before we had support for subnormal numbers, which is to say before we were checking th that the exponent doesn't go out of range during that scaling operation. Um, and I stuck this in as just like a band-aid to prevent that loop running forever, trying to sk constantly scale up zero to get it to go somewhere, which of course was never going to work. And I had this remove special logic about zero enumerator if possible once subnormals are implemented. Now, subnormals are implemented, so 
in theory, we could just remove that. And just just use this mainline code in all cases. Yeah. Because now zero is just being treated as es essentially a special case of a subnormal number. Um, in as much as that loop is going to iterate it's going to do as many iterations as necessary to hit the minimum possible exponent. And having hit that, it's then just going to bail out and say like, well, um, I can't make this number small enough. So you're just going to get whatever bits there are. And those bits are going to be zero. And so it will just work. So my initial desire to just remove that code has been vindicated by the fact that it was no longer necessary. So this will be remove a special case a redundant special case for zero numerator in encode. Um, this was added initially to prevent the uh, scaling loop from running forever before we had support for subnormal numbers. But now the scaling loop checks uh, scaling loop will terminate once the minimum exponent is hit so we can allow zeros to be handled by that instead of giving them special treatment okie doke that's good um, so I think all of this what's motivated a lot of the things that I've written here is a desire to just make this method less long and complicated. And so the this business about moving some of the things out into this format class and, um, and actually, uh, you know, maybe this chunk can go into the format class as well. Um, and yes, this round the significant if necessary really feels like it could just be in the same way as we've got a scale quotient method. Why don't we have a round quotient method? Um, so I do believe I am going to do that now. So let's make this, that's going to be the same thing again. Numerator, denominator, exponent equals round quotient. Numerator, denominator, exponent. And of course, this is getting quite repetitive but that is fuel on the fire of me wanting to extract a class that takes care of that packages up the numerator denominator and exponent into some kind of um you know legit data structure rather than just constantly passing them around in a three element array which is definitely a bit of a code smell so this is round quotient numerator denominator exponent quotients, exponents, um, don't think this comment's really earning its place anymore. So this just, yeah, as anticipated, this needs the numerator, the denominator. Oh, and by the way, like, maybe I should have said this explicitly, but the reason why I just without even thinking about it, passed in this same selection of arguments is that I remembered that there's that there's a call to scale quotient inside here. So we need all of this same information to be able to call scale quotient. Um, so what does this do? Oh, actually, this has a side effect of computing the significant. Um... You know, I was expecting to just return uh, numerator, denominator, exponent from this because that's really what this method does in the same in the same way as scale quotient does. Round quotient also just adjusts the numerator, the denominator, and the exponent. But I'd forgotten that it actually this chunk of code. One of the things it does is 
computes the quotient really um, Ah, yes. So this use of format significance here, I just got, you know, I just got done saying this. This here really should just be the argument quotients. Uh, you know, format isn't being passed in here. Um, I was briefly confused about why, how the word significant had crept into here, but I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of it. Um, and then rather than bothering to compute it inside here, um, I'm going to compute it after we call this. So I think Oh, except it's not called quotient, it's called sign Out here, it's called significant. <laughs> In the context of encoding a float, this thing, the quotient between the numerator and the denominator is the significant of the float. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, this here is the little chunk that computes the significant and then it adjusts the exponent and actually optionally the significant. Um, Oh, this is the this is in this is the infinity. That's interesting. I want to come back to this, but um, in this case, it adjusts the exponent to. Uh, again, yeah, this isn't very clear. What this is really saying is that actually, what this is saying is if the significant is if this is smaller than the smallest representable significant then this is saying set the exponent to the actual minimum exponent. <laughs> so this is an artifact of the problem I was complaining about before, but again, I'm, I'm going to not get sucked into that. Here, I should just be able to say exponent equals format.significans, uh, format.exponents.min, but I can't because that doesn't have the right value. So um, I will just leave this for now. So I think... This is all looking good. Um, I've just extracted that round quotient function. Um, and I don't think there's much worth saying about that. Extract round quotient from encode. Um, actually, looking at this function, I can see that Uh, this is just a style choice, right? But instead of reassigning these locals here, I could just return, I, you know, I'm just returning the result of scale quotient. So rather than putting an assignment there, I could just have an else here. You know, I don't need to reassign those. It's like you pass in a numerator, a denominator, and an exponent, and then I either change them or I don't. And changing them means calling scale quotient and whatever that returns is the is the answer um i think i'm also going to inline this because again there's no there's no need to modify this 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 can just be quotient plus one so i think that ultimately this is a little tidier now it's like we're given the numerator and the denominator we need to know the quotient and the remainder of that division and then based on the result of that we either adjust the quotient, round it up, and then rescale it just in case we need to, um, or we leave it alone. So I think that's I think that's a little bit clearer. Um, I'll just say clean up uh, round quotient to make uh, its purpose clearer. I hope I hope that it does. Um, so I've done extract round quotient. Um, I am really, I, I do really want to get to this because this feels like a major improvement to um, how complicated this encode method is. Um, 
but then again kind of dealing with this these many calls to the return numerator denominator exponent would also be helpful i think um So I think what I'm going to do is, yes, I'm going to make a method that calls both of these. I mean, I think just straightforwardly, I can just pull this code out into its own method, can't I? I think, you know, if I have a method called like scale, round quotient uh, with all this you know that feels like I guess it would be this that feels like it's at least hiding the complexity of of all of this and then I do still need yeah there's this sort of separate decision about about adjusting the exponent depending on whether the significant is at the end of its range um, so let's put this here I mean really I'm just trying to make this method as small as possible that, that method as small as possible so this one can just return stuff directly um, I mean there's a temptation to stick these into an array and then splat it at the beginning here but I think I'm gonna I've sort of swept some stuff under the rug there uh, what have I done wrong Oh, uh, yes, quotient, exponent, and then I need to do the same thing here. Okay, um, still a bit of a mess. But again, I think I'm driving towards the main reason why this is so messy is that we've got this data clump, I think, numerator, denominator, exponent. And so I think now that I've sort of isolated the effect of that, I think it's going to be less of a problem to extract it. So I'm going to say extract scale and round quotient method. Uh, so that was that one. Uh, I did the remove special logic about zero numerator as discussed. I think I feel like this is the inevitable conclusion now is like deal with this numerator denominator exponent thing. Um, although I noticed that really th I could just inline this exponent thing now. Um, ooh, I don't think I need this anymore. The reason I had this at the top here was in order to, s even though numerator and denominator are getter methods on self, the code inside here was assigning to them uh yeah here um but now that this has been extracted out into a method uh i don't think i need those local variables anymore so i'm just going to try removing that i think the only uses of numerator and denominator are they're like r only red uh oh no hold on what am i talking about it was it was this this is what was causing the problem it's the fact that when they appear here they show up as nil sorry that was 
that was nonsense. Um, so I do still need them. But what I was also going to say is that this can just be inlined. Like that's one less piece of business um, going on in that method. Uh, inline, initial, exponent, in, encode. Um, right, well, let's try and do this then. Uh, extract a class to encapsulate the numerator, denominator, exponent, data clump. Um, all right, but what should that be called? Uh, I don't know. Uh, number wang equals struct.new numerator denominator exponent. I will strive to come up with a better name than that, but this is just. So what will this code look like? What I will do is I'll say number wang equals number wang dot new numerator denominator. Uh, I guess the exponent is going to be that format dot fraction site fraction bits. So that's the idea is to like wrap it up. wrap it up in a data structure and then instead of threading well I mean obviously I could improve this by just making these three arguments here uh, three separate arguments I could just make them a single value i.e. a number wang but I think it's easier to just move these methods onto it. Like if I move these methods on, uh, onto here, then, then none of them need arguments. Sorry, that's what I'm trying to say is that like, it, essentially the argument becomes self. Um, so if I do that, like I don't need any of this because those will all be coming off self. So this really just needs quotients and exponents to do its job. Um, so let's think about how this works. So previously, these methods returned the numerator and denominator and exponent. But now I think they should just modify it. So they should, when you call these methods, they sort of update the data structure. <laughs> Um, and so they don't need to, so we don't need to return anything here and we don't need to return anything here and this doesn't need any argument. So you can see this, this whole thing is getting much, oh, how do I deal with this? Oh, I can just reassign. So here, this is that call is saying well the numerator is becoming the quotient plus one the denominator is becoming one and then we just scale hmm okay so this means that I just need to call number wang dot scale and round quotient and I need to tell it the quotients and the exponents and these are format dot exponents and these are format dot significance um,
again I'm not entirely sure why I've decided to make these keyword arguments but I think maybe it's because it I don't know now that these are the only things that we're passing in it feels like it's giving me a bit of breathing space to be clearer about what they are um I don't know why I put numerator here this should be number line um so let's let's uh, take that through I guess because it's pretty easy to do in fact I might as well yeah I think that's I it's not really any kind of justification but for some reason when this came down to just a couple of arguments I feel like well that's now we can realistically call those methods with keywords without it taking up 10 lines um Uh, so I'm nearly, I've, I'm nearly done with that extraction, but now uh, right. So what do I expect? How do I expect to get the exponent now? Um, I mean, obviously, I can just I can fetch all of these. Hmm, okay. Well, I'm just thinking about whether this conditional needs like a Goldilocks clause at the end here. <laughs> that's like, because this is all about is the significance too small? Is it too large? Or is it just right? And I imagine that the just right case is exponent is equal to the number wang exponent. And these ones, you know, because I'm thinking about what I was trying to figure out was like, when do I initialize the exponent basically? And I think that this conditional, which was previously modifying the exponent, could just be exponent equals. And then this is the same thing. Like I said, I, I'm a bit annoyed that these, that we can't just go straight to the format for these. Um, in fact, we can ask. Yeah, that's a separate step. But I think here I can take number wang out of the equation. <laughs> um, because this, if the significant has hit, if the, if the scaling loop has terminated with a significant that is still too small for the format, then that means that we're already at the lowest possible exponent. So this number wang dot exponent will also be format dot exponents dot min at that point because that's the condition that stops that loop and vice versa with the maximum here. But um, I'm just going to take this refactoring one step at a time and I can't really refactor anything that's got number wang in it. Um, Nonetheless, I'm expecting this to work unless, well, I mean, I probably have overlooked something, but I don't know what it is that I've overlooked, such as the nature of overlooking things. Right. What? One, one, Undefined method slash for numerator denominator exponent hash. Okay, what have I done wrong? I have forgotten. Oh, roll on Ruby 3.2. That's what I say. 
I've forgotten that. Okay, well, you know, we can't all remember things. Um, I think I'm going to put this below finite because, I mean, arguably it could even be, could sort of be part of, like it could be, oh, it doesn't matter. I, I'm just thinking in terms of what namespace should number wang be in. I'm not convinced it should be in float, um, but whatever. I think I've got more serious naming problems. Um, okay, so this works. Let me just run all of the tests just to check that there's not something I've overlooked. Okay, so that works fine. Um, what do I call this? Um, Um, I suppose what this represents is not so much the separate numerator and denominator and exponent, but conceptually what it represents is a specific, it represents a, a a specific approximation to some, to a number that we started with. In fact, when you first instantiate this, it's, well, in the general case, it's a very poor approximation for the number that you want. Um, by which I mean, if you just take the quotient, if you just do the division of the numerator by denominator, um, then you get, you know, a very inaccurate answer. And then as we improve, as we, as we sort of move that approximation into the quotient into the Goldilocks zone, where it's a 24-bit number or a 53-bit number or whatever, um, then it becomes a much better approximation. Um, I mean, approximation is a better name than number wang. Uh, so maybe that is maybe that's what I'll call it. <laughs> maybe I'll just call it approximation. Um, Okay, well, I think well, yeah, I'm going to call it approximation because that's because number one is a silly name. Um, but I'm also slightly reconsidering my decision to push this my, my decision to push the assignment to make the assi assignment of exponent happen inside here. And the reason for that is because <sighs> it's because I want to leave myself enough maneuvering room to be able to extract all of this logic as well. Um, and I think if I, if I separate this, like 
this this is actually a smaller change to to uh to what I had before. Um so you can see in terms of the diff, this is actually making the diff smaller as well. So I think although my initial instinct was to try and try and fold that approximation into this conditional it sort of feels like keeping this stuff together because essentially these li these four lines of code are now responsible for computing the significant and the exponent and then we've got like a little thing here that just tweaks it but otherwise this is nicely self-contained and that's i think that's what i was trying to say was that by making this self-contained it makes it a much juicier target for extraction rather than having it be there being like a transporter accident that sort of interleaved it with some other part of this code i think i think it is actually in my interest to leave it all together like that um so i think i'm gonna leave it like that for now um Hmm. I think that's probably a commit, isn't it? So I'm going to say... extract approximation class to deal with scaling and rounding of quotient. Um, so now I, I really don't see why I can't just why this can't just be a method. Like if instead of that, I could just write significant and exponent is equal to In fact, I don't even need to Yeah, it's actually, I just need to approximate within the format because I already know I'm inside an instance that has a numerator and a, de and a denominator. I don't need to pass them in. I just need to know. Yes, I need to know the fraction bits and the, and the significance and the exponents. So if I just pass in the format, So what this is saying is I want to approximate, you know, we've already got a numerator and a denominator here. I want to approximate that ratio, that rational number. I want to approximate it with a significant and w which is going to be within the range allowed by the format and an exponent that is within the range allowed by the format. So I think that actually works quite well. Um, so we've got a private method here that's approximate within. And, you know, the reason that format is an argument here is because you can make one of these finite floats and then encode it at different bit widths with different formats and then obviously the approximation is going to be better or worse depending on the size of the format so that matches exactly my intuition about how this kind of thing is supposed to work so i can make an approximation i can scale and round it um And then I suppose I'm just returning this pair.
of the quotient of the numerator and the denominator and the exponent. Like, I mean, I guess I could put an instance method on the approximation that does this, but I think uh, it's not necessary. Uh, let's just make this a little bit more readable. So we make a new approximation Not very happy with this method name but like this is all starting to feel a little bit more literate like reading this code is now starting to <laughs> feel more like my mental model of how you solve this problem which is really what the purpose of this refactoring is is to try and get myself to a place where when i look at this code i'm just like oh yeah that's what i expected to see um Anyway, does this, of course, that's all academic if none of this actually works. Okay. So this is um, extract approximate within method. And this is really just a helper. Um, So now I think I have got to the point that I wanted to get to where we don't need this numerator and denominator anymore. We're just... approximating within whatever format we've been asked for. Then we do this diddling of the exponent and the significant then we add the bias and then we assemble the bits. Okay, I really like that. Um, remove redundant numerator and denominator local variables. Oh, thanks Tekken, I'm glad that you approve. <laughs> it feels satisfying to me. Um, uh, oh yeah, I don't need to explain that, they are clearly redundant. Um, so god even though even though i've written all of these things down i feel like my brain is gonna burst with things that i want to improve here um just want to pop the stack a couple of times so i don't really like the names of these number wang methods anymore i want i i again in terms of literacy i really want this to be something like fit within like I want, I've made an approximation. I want to fit it within, maybe that's not the best phrasing, but I want to fit it within these quotients and exponents. And then within the approximation, I sort of want these to be, you know, the way you make it fit within those quotients and exponents is first you scale it within and then you round it within which and and the reason it's rounding within is because after you round it you have to it could have overflowed out of the range and then you need to scale it again so i know this is all getting a bit i know i'm fiddling with absolutely tiny details here but this is really the only way i know of getting something that's good <laughs> um uh, i really don't like this comment either because yeah well i'll deal with that separately did I lose a keyword argument on fit within? Yeah, I did. How did that happen? Oh, incompetent vimming. As is so often the case. Well spotted, Tekken. Thank you. I mean, you know, now we've got a bit of a. There's something a bit. The quotients and exponents are sort of clumping together a little bit, but I think that feels more tolerable to me um okay 
Right. So what was this? Um, right. Okay. Well, this is just rename uh, approximation to say within. Um, this ma this better matches the approximate within method on finite and just generally makes more sense and uh, now that approximation is a self-contained concept not a very good justification for the change um i'm sorry i'm going to get rid of that comment that's that's offending me um Okay, so I think this is good. Like I said, I'm not entirely sure what namespace this approximation should be in. It doesn't, it's not really a peer of finite and nan and infinite. Um, but that feels like I'm really, that feels unimportant. Um, so another another thing that annoyed me when I was looking at this was, well, okay, two things. Thing the first, it's very upsetting that you can't see locally that this is setting this to a to a special exponent. It looks like it's just decrementing it, but it's really not. It's, well, I mean, it is, but what it's actually doing is setting it to, well, what is currently format.exponents.min minus one, which is to say it's actually the minimum exponent for the format. Um, I mean, I'm 99% sure that's true. Yeah, I think that is true. Uh, likewise here, this is just setting... you know, the true maximum exponent. Um, actually, the reason it's doing this is to indicate an infinity. So I think there's another something else we could do there. But um, I think I'll say use explicit min max exponent for, uh, well, subnormal infinite results just because I think that that makes it more obvious what's going on um, but the other thing is that really here by setting the significant to zero and setting the exponent to the maximum exponent and then jumping through these hoops I'm in this branch of the conditional what I'm really doing is just recreating whatever this does and uh, yeah there's some work to do here isn't there this is just the maximum exponent <laughs> so I'll, I'll get to that in a minute but um i think conceptually again and again for clarity i think it would be clearer that we're producing an infinite float here if i just say return infinite dot new i need to know whether it's negated and then I want to encode it. Oh, I wanted to pass the format in, but I can't. I have to pass bits in. Okay, well, there's a there's another problem there. The, the, these methods should just take format, not bits. It should be the caller's problem to determine what format they want. Um, but that's a, an impedance mismatch with what the interpreter knows about. So... Uh, make the interpreter pass in format, not bits. Um, so I think that line of code is m much more amenable to rapid understanding in terms of what does this branch of the conditional mean and what does it achieve. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to say delegate to infinite encode 
when in finite encode when the significand is too large. <sighs> okay. Um, let's think about Where am I? Okay. I'm 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 feeling really quite annoyed about this now. So what I here's what I want to do. What I would like to do is this method is currently broken. It's not at all obvious that it's broken, but what this method should be returning is the actual range of exponents. So a concrete example is that in a 32-bit float with an 8-bit exponent, the, the exponent bias is 127, so that's all of the bits except the most significant bit are set to 1. So the bias is 127. What that means is the smallest possible exponent is, 100, is, is minus 127 um, because the exponent bias gets subtracted from whatever is actually stored in those bits. So if you set all of the bits to zero, which is the smallest binary digit, then in the decoding process, it will have 127 subtracted from it. So the real smallest exponent is actually 127. And, and I guess I should be clear here that when I'm talking about ex what's the smallest exponent, I mean without the bias. In fact, as far as possible, it would be nice to, it would actually be a nice outcome of this refactoring if we can make it so that the whole concept of an exponent bias is actually encapsulated within this format class. And you don't even, as a user of the format class, you don't even need to know about biases. We're just, as far as a public API is concerned, an exponent is a signed number in some range, um, which, as I said, is between well, in the case of an 8-bit flow, between minus 127 and plus 128, um, which should intuitively make sense, <laughs> even though what you would really like is for it to be between minus 127 and plus 127, because that feels like the same size, but you've also got zero in the middle. So... Because the bias is taking you down by 127, I mean, I suppose the way to think about this is that, just like I said before, if you max out the exponent bits, if you put all ones in and then you subtract 127 to, to unbias the exponent, you get 128. So maybe that's the easier, rather than me waffling on about the existence of zero, just maybe pointing out in that example, because the bias is lopsided towards positive numbers um we get one more in the and this is exactly the sort of fiddly detail that you shouldn't have to be thinking about unless you're looking at this specific method and trying to understand like well why is that the why is that the range of exponents you shouldn't have to know about it so this is really what i want because now this is ground truth for the for whatever uh, float format we're using. But but then the, now the consumers of this have to deal with that, have to deal with the fact that the minimum is now one less than they are expecting it to be, and the maximum is now one more than they were expecting it to be. But I would rather, even if every single consumer of this needs to adjust the ends of the range in order to correct for their purposes... I think that's better than having this method return something that's got like an asterisk on it saying like, well, this isn't really the range of exponents. This is the range of exponents that can be used for normal numbers that aren't zeros or nans or infinities or, uh, or subnormal numbers. I think that's far too hard to understand. And it's uh, frankly amazing that I even remember that from Tuesday. I think by tomorrow I will have forgotten all of these details. So really what I'm, 
the the feeble mind I'm trying to protect here is my own. So Okay, so this is already interesting, right? That here exponents min minus one is now just exponents min if I make that adjustment. So that's a win. This was having to compensate for the fact that that minimum was one too high and now that compensation has gone away. Love it. Right. And I think maybe this is the only this is the only other place that cares about it because all of these now we're down into the number wang territory and i think all of these just flow from here so so yeah okay this makes sense the reason why that range of exponents was wonky is because i extracted it from the encode method on finite which was creating it specifically for this purpose so really i shouldn't be at all surprised that the one person who wants it to be wonky is the one place where I extracted it from. But I think that what I'm gonna have to do here is, you know, correct. Because it's definitely not the approximations problem. Like the whole purpose of extracting this and renaming significant to quotient and all of the other bits of pedantic change I made here was so that you can understand this approximation code in isolation without knowing anything about floating point numbers. Um, I mean, it's a bit esoteric if you don't know the application, but I think it is conceptually self-contained. And so I think it's important that we don't try and get this approximation class to start having knowledge about, oh, of course, the 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 very maximum and very minimum exponent actually have special semantics. And so we should avoid using those. Like that's... I don't want like if anyone needs to understand that it's this method here that is this is the connective tissue between the domain of doing stuff in floating point numbers the sort of concrete domain of that application and the more abstract domain of oh we're just adjusting a rational number <laughs> to make it fit within some range to make the quotient fit within some range um so what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is I'm just going to add one here and I'm going to subtract one here. I'm actually not, I'm not sure about the operator precedence. And although I think it's probably okay because the range operator has got quite a low precedence, I think the fact that I'm unsure about it makes me want to uh, clarify it there. Okay, test. Yes. Yeah, I'm now I very very quickly moved into the into the realm of running all of the tests because I'm I see like why wasn't I so nervous about this? You know, this clearly I was right that this <laughs> that the range is lower precedence. Oh well whatever. Whatever. Um okay. All right, I'm, ex I'm actually quite excited about this because I think what I'm going to get in exchange for one piece of ugliness here is I'm expecting to find other places where I can use the minimum and maximum exponent directly because they are quite important and we already saw one in infinite. Um, and I think that is going to be a significant, like improvement in the clarity of the implementation if I can if I'm explaining in words what the meaning of this particular number is rather than just conjuring it out of bit shifts and and bitwise operations I think that will be that will make the code much more comprehensible so uh, return correct range of exponents from uh, format exponents so just very briefly um, because this was extracted from finite encode, it actually didn't include the very minimum and very maximum exponents because those have special meanings in IEEE 754. 
which is both confusing and actively inconvenient for other people who want to use the actual minimum and maximum exponents precisely because they are special. It's therefore better to return the accurate range here and correct for that in the one place, i.e. encode, uh, finite encode, that cares about it, that needs something different. Right. Um, done. So, trying to remember what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was look for places where I think someone really means a minimum or maximum exponent. Um, who's using the bias? Okay, well that's yeah, that's a wild goose chase. Okay, um, the reason I was doing that is because that's what the minimum and maximum exponent sort of are. But I can see that there are places that are using it for a different reason. Um, which is to say, using it as an actual bias, uh, which I don't want to mess with. Um, so this is it, isn't it? This one shifted left by the number of exponent bits minus one, it, that is an attempt to recreate the minimum exponent. And that makes sense. It's saying if this is the minimum exponent, then return either an infinite or a nan. So this would be far better if it said format.exponents.min Oh, except that's wrong. Oh, sorry, it's max. I <laughs> it's this is a positive number. <laughs> um yes, of course. Yes. Uh <sighs> Hold on. Hold on. What am I what am I talking about? I'm I, I, what I'm doing there is premature because this hasn't been corrected for the bias. So I can't just use it. Um I'm going to have to Okay, yeah, I jumped the gun there. And this is an example of the kind of thing that I should, you know, the kind of problem that is being caused is that I've, even I've lost track of whether, of what the meaning of exponent is here. So, so even though I was excited to say, oh, what, what this code is actually doing is just looking for, okay, I got confused about whether it was the minimum or the maximum. It's looking for the maximum because this is infinite, not subnormal. Um, but I mean, maybe I could say if it's equal to format dot exponent dot maximum plus minus. The bias. It's really doing my head in. Exponents. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, my I think my my brain is stopping working here. 
Okay, it's it's plus, isn't it? All right. Well, I think I've sort of accidentally illustrated my point here, which is that this is... Okay, all right. Well, let's say that actually decode here... Let's say, oh, I mean, this is going down a rabbit hole, isn't it? You know, this was what I wanted to happen. Uh, I'm sorry, I've, I've got very confused about what's going on here, so I'm just going to... The, the mathematics of that don't make sense to me. Uh, so I'm just going to move on. I'm going to come back to this, but what really what I need to do is... Oh, I've done this. Um, I want to say here something like... Um, Stop making me deal with the exponent bias, um, i.e. conceal it entirely within float format, please. I'm not ready to do that yet, but that's what I would like to do. Um, yeah, all of these, it's actually not, it's actually not good. It's not as good as I wanted it to be. Oh, I just realized what, I've just realized what my confusion was though. It was just, again... Uh, high school inability I mean even high school is being generous it's more of a primary school inability to understand which side of the equal sign the bias goes the reason why I was having to add it on here is because that's effectively subtracting it from the exponent so that's okay exponent minus equals exponent bias oh it's kind of inconvenient that there's another legitimate local variable that's one letter off so we knock that off the exponent and then we can say format.exponents.max. I'm if this is wrong, then I'm just gonna delete all of this code and log off. <laughs> it's okay if it's wrong for that reason. Um I mean why don't I just do that here? can't decide what the right way to deal with that is. Whatever. I'll put it there for now. Oh, but we... All of the rest of this code... <laughs> all of the rest of this code is expecting to subtract the... Okay, right. Well... Ugh. Okay. Well... I think my first instinct to leave that alone for now was correct because, I mean, I haven't followed through on my threat to delete everything and log off. I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep, I'm going to keep muddling through. I'm too bloody minded. Um, okay, so, okay, so even though I believe that there are places where I should be able to use those, the maximum minimum exponents. This code is such a mess right now that I'm worried. I'm worried that I'm just going to make it worse if I try and change any of that. So I think. I think the thing that would unlock that for me would be this, because, if we have dedicated, because at the moment there's a load of code duplication, um, 
every single one of these encode methods ends with the same kind of stanza for assembling the bits of the float. And if I just extracted those and put them in one place, then that could be the place where the bias gets added and then nothing, and then, and likewise for the unpack, and then nothing else ever needs to think about the fact that there's a flipping bias. So that really feels like it would be a quality of life improvement. So I'm going to try and get those working. Let's, I will call it pack for now. And I think finite has got the best, the most representative example of that in the sense that it's fully general. So I'm not going to think about the bias for a moment. I'm just going to just going to get the bit twiddling and then we'll think about I want to be very deliberate about moving this. There's going to be a there's going to be a judo move that I'm going to do where this whole thing is just going to click into place when all of the lines of code that are fiddling with the exponent and adding and removing the bias are just going to be deleted in one commit and those lines are all going to coalesce into pack and unpack and then it's going to be glorious, uh, he says. Um, so this is supposed to return format.pack something. Um... And it's going to be something like this. Uh, but I don't know what it's going to be. Let's go and look at the code and see what the see what it actually needs. Ugh, stupid comment. Um, okay, so it's going to need to know: is it negated? Oh. Well, I've maybe bitten off too much here. Maybe it should just be this bit for now. Yeah, I'm just going to take this really slow. Because this, all that you pass into this are just the final pieces. And all this is doing is just assembling them. So let's start with that. I want it to do more than that because I think, for example, this should, instead of taking sign, this should be able to take a Ruby Boolean that is negated and then do the, it knows how to serialize that into a sign bit. But um, for now, let's just make this like raw bit patterns, sign, exponent, fraction. And then all of this feature envy stuff goes away because exponent bits is on, is on, I am, but doctor, I am format. So that's an improvement, I think, because it's not having to reach out to format. It is, we are there. And then this just needs to pass in sign exponent fragment fraction. Um, and in fact, I can inline these, can't I? Uh, because, you know, those local variables are not really earning their... You know, that's... I think I've got quite a lot of habit forming around this from positional argument world where I sort of use local variables who who I am initializing only to pass in as arguments as sort of inline documentation of what the meaning of that value is. But I think now that we've got keyword arguments, I kind of feel like sticking that in a local variable just purely so that I can use hash punning to then pass in a keyword argument with the same name it feels a little bit redundant. I don't need fraction to be written twice. I just need it. I mean, it doesn't need to be written there at all. This could just be a positional argument, but I feel like writing it once right next to the expression that computes it is actually a pretty good way of, um, 
a pretty good way of communicating the meaning of that value. So does that actually work? It would appear so. So where else can I get away with that? So same thing here, format.pack, uh, sign is, as always, negated, one, zero. Um, exponent is, yeah, again, I'm just not gonna think about that because it makes me cross. Um, uh, in this case, there is value in having it in a local variable because we have to do this conditional, well, we are doing this conditional mutation, um, which is, this was the thing I did last time, this is just belt and braces, but it was actually required for some of the truncating stuff where, not truncating, that means something else. I mean, the thing where we were converting a 64-bit float into a 32-bit float and we ended up chopping off some of the payload um, we need to do this so that we don't end up with a fully zero payload in a NAN, which is not acceptable for a NAN, because if, there's, if the payload is all zeros, then that's an infinity. So this was, was like, we, we mask out the payload. Uh, yeah, which itself is sort of interesting maybe there should be uh use the mask helper um because i that's you know my interpretation of what this is is that this is this one shifted left by fraction bits minus one is making a fraction bits or ones and then anding it is just masking those it's just pulling those bits out of the payload um it would have been much easier to remember that if oh, if it just said mask payload bits format dot fraction bits, um, and then yeah, it mutates it uh, if it needs to to make sure that it's non-zero. So that's a extremely verbose way of saying I think it's okay for fraction to be kind of named multiple times there because I think this is the mo the easiest to under once I've re rewritten this with. Um, meaningful names, I think this is the easiest thing to read. Um, so let's think about this. So this is format.pack. Um, sign is negated as usual. Exponent, again, making me angry, I'm not gonna think about it. Um, so this has an implicit zero fraction But I think it's correct that this pack method should, I don't think we should allow you to leave any of these out. I think you should have to provide them. So I think actually the fact that I was getting away with just not, of just not saying what the fraction was that in that expression was a little bit naughty. So I think this is all of them because I've done, yeah, I've done, infinite, nan, and finite, uh, and finite also doubles as zero, because um, zero is finite. Does this still work? Yep. So, uh, what is this? Extract format pack. I think I think it is. I would like for it to take for it to eventually take more responsibility than this. E.g., how to turn negated into the sign bit, how to adjust the exponent to account for the bias. But this is a decent start. Okay, now before I forget, let's do the same on the other side. 
so what does this I guess what we get here is what I've called encoded down here. Um, maybe that's not the best name for it. But essentially, well, for now, we're just taking this bit. Uh, in the same spirit, uh, so this is, again, masking is happening here. It would be nice if it was obvious. So get the fraction, get the exponent, get the sign. And then, and then we're just going to return them. Uh, sign, exponent, fraction. Um, uh, maybe it would be nice, because they're keywords that come in here, it would actually be nice. I want to make this as symmetrical as possible. Um, so it would actually be nice if this was a hash. Um, does that make sense? What I'm saying is pack takes in some keywords and gives you back a single integer, and I sort of want unpack to be the inverse of that, and the closest I can get to an inverse of that is to return a hash. I know that hashes and keywords have got like a complicated relationship, but visually at least, this looks more like... In fact, I should rewrite... Okay. I'll come back to this in a sec, but there's no reason why the bodies of these two methods sh should look so different. I've, I'm using two different strategies here to pack and unpack, and I should just consolidate them and, and do them the same way. So I will do that. Um, but anyway, let's finish this refactoring. So um, what's nice about that is that I can just say format.unpack encoded, and then it can go into sign exponent fraction I believe does that work no Ah, yes, thank you, Tekken. I, once again, have forgotten to remove the format dot. <laughs> thank you. Good. Yes, of course, this is the whole point. Well spotted, thank you, thank you. Sweet. Uh, and I think that's the only place, this is less of an obvious win, because I think there is only one place that we do decoding, so I don't, I don't think there's anywhere else that I need to do that, but just for the sake of removing that sort of feature envy, I think it's an improvement. Um, what am I doing? Um, extract format unpack from uh, float decode that's right isn't it yes let me just fix this up so that it says the same sort of thing. Um, okay, so what was the point of all this? Um, again, the, the desires are really piling up in my brain. Um, so I, what I was saying was that I don't really like that this is different 
uh, if I want to make these two methods sort of symmetrical, then I think as far as possible, you should be able to read them and see the same pieces in them, which conceptually these pieces are the same, but they don't look the same. And this is being done imperatively. And this is being done in a more sort of functional style. Um, and I think this is probably slightly easier to understand. So I think having something where it's like encoded equals something and then encoded uh, is shifted up by something and then encoded is, well, I guess we're or something. I think that's probably nicer. Uh, so what does that look like? Um, it's the sign bit first. And then we have to make room for the exponent. And then we put the exponent in. And then we have to make room for the fraction. And then we put the fraction in. And then we return that. Okay, um, that's sort of similar, although I would really like some regularity here. So I think something like this, and then I, does this, does this just return? Yeah, I mean, that just returns Um, I think that's sort of fine. Yeah, you're right. I don't need the assignment at the end, but I'm just trying to make it, I'm trying to make it look the same. I know it doesn't, I know we don't need to reassign that, but I wanted it to look the same. Um... I think it's perhaps better to be explicit about it. Um, again, because I want some, I want the symmetry between these two things, and I, 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 I fully accept that it's not necessary to stick this at the end, and it's not necessarily to not necessary to initialize this with zero. But I, I'm just trying to make this as legible as possible. Um, Hmm. Actually don't really like the name encoded here. Now that I think about it. Um I think I'm going to go with this though. I think I've just about managed to convince myself that that the overhead of doing that is worthwhile. Um, rewrite format pack to look more like unpack. <laughs> um, this doesn't really matter. I just want it to be as obvious as possible that there each other's inverse. Yeah, I really don't like calling this encoded. I only called it encoded because I picked that up from down here, but actually I don't think I like it. I think I'd rather just call it integer. Um, Um, it was really here that I introduced that, wasn't it? Hmm. 
No, but that's the reason I called it encoded was to distinguish it from this is literally being treated as an integer. So I've changed my mind. There is actually some kind of meaning that I was trying to communicate here. So I'm going to stick with that for now. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so. Yes, I think the thing that I would like to do is to is to move more smarts into it. So for, you know, to make this return negated directly and to make make this just be negated. Uh, yes, that's what I was looking for. So I, I guess I'm doing this now. Um, I want to push that in. I mean, that's the simplest possible smart thing that I could push into pack, right? Is just an unpack is make it understand the concept of a sign bit. So in here, instead of sign, this is gonna be negated, and then I'm gonna say sign, so I'm just pushing that. What I had before is being pushed in. Now the sort of symmetrical situation down here is to say negated equals sign is one and then this becomes negated. So again, I mean, I could put that in line there, but I sort of want it to balance on both sides of this sort of matched pair of method implementation. So I think having a little separate section here, rather than doing it in line here or in line in the hash, is sort of worth it just for the, just for the symmetry of it. Um, let's see if that works. Yes. Um, should I do the rest of it? What's the rest of it? The exponent bias. Um, no, I'll do this first. Um, uh, make format pack and unpack deal with the negated Boolean, not the sign bit. Um, cause the, I think the other change is more hairy, which is the, I want to say the exponent. Well, I suppose what I'm really saying here is that I want to compute a biased exponent, which is the one that I've been given plus the exponent bias. And then what gets encoded here is not the exponent, but the biased exponent. I mean, I think I've, I've chosen the more difficult one of these to do because there are three places that call this. Um, but let's let's just try it. So this is currently well, I'll tell you what, I can... So the exponent bias gets added on. So I can always just... I know that this is not where I want to end up, but I'm trying to... I'm trying to do a hand over hand change here um, and avoid it breaking. Well, I want to check that what I've done so far has not broken it. So, I mean, you can see something beautiful is going to happen here. Um, in fact, my hope is that something beautiful is going to happen everywhere. Okay, so that's good. Now let's look for opportunities to make something beautiful happen because the, the beautiful thing is that 
we're already adding the bias here and then I need to remove it in order to pass it in. So now those two things just cancel out like matter and antimatter and we get, again, that encode method has now got less junk in it. Um, I mean, this is now getting extremely small, which I'm very happy about um, and because it hasn't just got small by me <laughs> sweeping a pile of junk under the rug it's got small by me organizing the knowledge <laughs> into the appropriate places and that's really the most satisfying thing um bom, 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 bom. okay so what else did i so here i've subtracted the exponent bias from one so this that's all the ones right so that is the biased version of the maximum exponent and then when i'm subtracting the bias from it that's making the unbiased version of the maximum exponent. So I think I can just say format exponents max here, which is way better than what was written there before. I can't remember if this is the one I was picking on. It, well, it's the same up here. And like this is this is beautiful because this is what I've been trying to achieve for the last hour is to be able to just straightforwardly say if you want to encode an infinity or a nan, you use the maximum exponent. And until now, I haven't been able to say that. But now, well, I've been a bit premature. I haven't run the test yet. Okay, now I'm saying what I mean, which is use the maximum exponent when you're encoding a nan or an infinity. So that's really good. I'm very happy with that. Um... Thank you, Tekken. That celebration, celebratory emoji was a hard one on my part. Um, so what's the contrary wise change down here? I suppose what we're saying is that this is now what we retrieve from the bit pattern is the biased exponent. And then the exponent is the biased exponent minus the exponent by us, which is slightly ridiculous but in a way perfectly logical and then the caller of unpack needs to know about that oh shiz okay well That looks rather hairy. I'm going to need to work through. There's yeah, there's a lot going on there. So let's just let's just lock that in. So in this previous one, I I bundled those two together. Um, I think maybe I'll make a commit here because it feels like it's going to require some rocket surgery on some of this. And it's not going to be difficult, but like I need to take this carefully because there are multiple control flow paths through this code here and it's not there's nested conditionals and stuff so it's actually rather nasty um so i'm just gonna leave that there for now as a like a shim and then i will go and dissolve the shim in a minute so this is just so that i can complete this pair of commits so make format pack and unpack deal with unbiased exponents. Uh, this way, at least in principle, no other code needs to know about exponent biases. However, There's enough code in decode, which depends upon the biased exponent, that I'm not going to try to expunge all knowledge 
as part of this commit. It will be in the next commit though. Right, so now how do I, how do I dissolve this shim? Um, I mean, I suppose I can just take it a step at a time, right? Like in here, I can say this is yeah, I could just commit pack Tekken, but I, in the previous, what I was trying to do was get into a situation where I had two commits here, one of which was, the, the way I was choosing to slice it was, let's add the ability to take a boolean rather than a sign bit, and then let's add the ability to take a, an unbiased exponent rather than a biased one. Um, and And I've completed that now. <laughs> So that's why I'm allowing myself to get away with that, even though really I've just made a bit more of a mess by doing that. Um, oh, what was I doing? What I was doing was I was saying I could, to help me think about this, I could just inline this expression. So like everywhere I have exponent, now becomes exponent plus exponent bias and then see if I can boil all of those away. Um, uh, where does it appear? Yeah, that's not gonna work because like I said, the problem is that we're sort of conditionally subtracting the bias from it so that's the real problem. That's really what I'm shying away from. So what's standing in my way here? Why are we... Why don't we... It feels like we should always be removing the bias. Oh. Okay, this was something that I, I forgot I'd spotted this. Um... I'm going to say that I've done this because I have I have given it pack and unpack and I right now I'm doing this one but this is the thing that I noticed earlier don't care about exponent when decoding zero that's what we're doing here um so what's going on in decode here is that really you should always subtract the exponent bias because the exponent that you got out of the number that you've decoded, the bits you've got, are stored in a bias. They're encoded with a bias, and so you should always remove it. But I'm not doing that in the specific case where it's zero. And I think the reason why I'm doing that is just so that the denominator in this unit test is a one. But of course, if you've got a rational number whose numerator is zero, it doesn't matter what the denominator is. This could be anything. Um, and this looks like this is a zero as well. Um, so I think this is sort of misguided. Like it made sense to me at the time that it's like, well, look, you know, if it is just literally the number that it's supposed to be, then the the denomin if it's if it's just an integer, then the denominator should be one, even if the integer is, is zero. But I think that's too well. Not only is that being too specific, I also think it's just sort of not right that like. I'm not going to bother looking and seeing what IEEE 754 has to say about this, but I think in a very real sense, the correct... I mean, look, we can see down here, 2 to the power of 149, like this is a subnormal number. This is the smallest subnormal positive number that you can express in 32 bits. And this exponent is the one that you expect to show up for all subnormal numbers. This is the minimum exponent for 32-bit floats. 
And zero is just a special case of a subnormal number. It's, it's the subnormal number where all of the fraction is set to zero. So I think it makes, although it's, I understand why I put one here when I was writing these unit tests on, on the last stream, but I think that this should be two to the power of 149. And, and that's going to cause the test to fail. Right. C rightly so. But the only reason that test is failing is because I'm gating. All of this. Behind this conditional. I, I think if I just take this conditional out and say, look, if the exponent zero, then we've got a zero or, or a subnormal number. And so the significant is just the fraction. Uh, and in the other case, you have to set the hidden bit. If in the case where you set the hidden bit, then we have to knock off the fraction bits from the exponent to account for the fact that, you know, um, the, the fraction was a 23-bit number. The significant is going to be a 24-bit number. Um, and fraction bits is 23. So we're going to subtract those from the exponent so that it becomes one dot that the hidden bit dot the rest of the fraction. In this case, we're not adding that one dot. The whole fraction is the number that we're representing. And so that's why we subtract one from it, is to account for the non-presence of the hidden bit. And I think we should just do that unconditionally, not only for subnormal numbers, because it's not worth this complexity that was being introduced for the sort of aesthetic pleasantness of getting this method to return zero, uh, to return one as being the denominator of a zero is silly. <laughs> I think it should just be there. I think we should just accept. Oh, no. <laughs> I was really hoping that would work. Okay, so let, let me back out of the... I got so excited about having a rant, I sort of lost track of what it was that I was doing here. The numerator has to be zero. The denominator does not have to be one because the denominator literally doesn't matter. Okay. Oh, that's what... Oh, God, I'm such a... I'm such a plonker. That's why it was broken. Just a simple typo. There we go. So... I'm going to, well, I'm just going to retype what I said there, which is don't care about exponent when decoding zero. And I'm going to say I'd gone to the trouble of making sure the exponent was something nice when we decoded a zero, but it really doesn't matter. Well, let's say denominator. What it is as long as the numerator is zero, we can make this code much simpler by just allowing the natural <laughs> 
exponent to uh, carry through to the denominator, even if it is slightly ugly. No, I'm not even going to say that. I think it's totally fine. So my claim in this commit, my forward-looking statement about the next commit was not true. <laughs> okay. Don't want to go telling lies in my in my commit history, do I? That's why rebasing is so important. History is full of mistakes. Um, but like Sam Beckett, we can put right what once went wrong. Um, okay. All right, well, if only I'd done this sooner, I wouldn't have been in so much trouble here because now, well, a couple of lovely things can happen. Firstly, now this is invariant across the... Oh, I was going to move it before the conditional, but actually I can't. I have to move it after the conditional. So we're subtracting the bias in both cases. So again, let's take this really slow. Um... Subtracting the bias afterwards. And again, that makes the fact that... Yeah, there was a lot of confusion happening here just because of that one silly decision I made in the previous stream. Like, this is much nicer because the fiddling with the bias inside this conditional is not really connected to the other things that are going on here. Because um, this conditional is about setting the significand from the fraction and then adjusting the exponent to account for that. And the bias is nothing to do with that. So the only reason this was inside the conditional in the first place was because we were trying to avoid doing this in the case of the zero. And I just sort of opportunistically moved it in there because this was already a conditional on zero, but really it should have been separate. So that was a mistake on my part. Um, now, of course, sub subtracting something from the exponent is sort of, in general, commutes with this other subtraction on the exponent, but the problem is this conditional. Like, sorry, what I'm trying to do here is move this up until it collides with the result of unpack, right? Because if I can, if I can move this all the way up to here then those two lines are a no-op and I can just delete them. So my goal at the moment is to try and inch this line further up until it touches that line and emits heat and light and all, the, all there is is just a scorch mark in my text editor and, and no code. So what I was saying was I don't have to worry about... It doesn't... It, it, this line will commute with the subtraction here and these significant assignments don't use the exponent, but it doesn't commute with this. If I move this to the other side, then I would have to add back on the bias in order to make that conditional, the sense of that conditional, stay the same. So that's something. Um, now, again, if I move it over this, then that's okay as long as I add it back in here, exponent plus format dot exponent bias. Okay, great. So now I get my matter antimatter reaction at the top there and those two things cancel out. But it's not really a win until I find a way to reinterpret th these conditions. Because the whole premise here is that we, we shouldn't need to know about the exponent bias from outside of the format class. So what are we really talking about here? So, well... This one is quite easy. If the exponent plus the exponent bias is zero, 
that is an indication that it was the minimum exponent. So I think it, this condition can just be if exponent is format exponents.min. Yeah. Oh no. Oh, because I can't type. Why? <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I suppose if I'm going to be making errors, it's better that I'm making, you know, motor errors than sort of errors in my understanding. My understanding was faultless. Um, it was just my execution that was questionable. Um, so that's great. Again, now this now accords very well with if the exponent is the minimum possible exponent, then you got yourself a subnormal number there and you have to you have to decode it in a special way compared to any other kind of number. So that is perfect. Um, what about this? If the exponent plus the bias, oh, this is very similar. This one was checking the adding the exponent gave adding the bias gave you zero, indicating that it was the minimum. This is asking if we add the bias, do we get the maximum possible exponent? or the maximum possible number expressible in those bits, so all ones instead of all zeros. So that's just asking whether this is the maximum exponent. So this has revealed some structure in this method that, I mean, I'm sure at some point I realized it was there, but I didn't realize that that's what this code was doing. This is actually just a case on exponent. That's really cool. Okay, I'm I'm again feeling quite happy about that because I didn't realize I mean it makes sense. Of course, of course that's what it's doing. I think I talked about this before. Of course, it's looking to see if it's the maximum exponent and returning an infinite or a nan depending on whether the fraction's zero or not. That is I should have realized that, but it was obscured by all the weird bit shifting gubbins. Um so I'm going to say stop, uh, you know, remove exponent bias entirely in decode. Um, let's say all of these, what were they, comparisons? Comparisons actually make more sense without the exponent bias anyway. So good riddance. Okay, so I think now, unless I've missed something, yeah, this is only used inside format. So I can finally achieve my dream of making this private. So it's it's an important quantity because it's used in several places to sort of flesh out, you know, what is the exponent range? Um, how do exponents get encoded and decoded? Um, but no one outside of format needs to know about that and making it private is the best way of communicating that. Great. Make was minor float format exponent bias private. Um, now nobody outside of the class needs to know about it. So let's make it so let's hide it entirely. All right. Um, stop making me deal with the exponent bias. Great.
Use the mask helper. Yeah, I think that would be... So that is in here. I've got a method called mask. I am going to, for now, just copy it. Um, let's make a... <laughs> this seems a little bit slightly overkill uh, for a single method. But I think this is the only this is the only one I know about so far that's like a generally useful thing. So I'm looking for this pattern where I'm anding something with one shifted left by bits. Let's find all of the bitwise ands in this file. Yeah, look, this is gonna this is nice. Mask encoded bits fraction bits. Uh, mask encoded exponent bits and I think here mask oops here encoded bits one thus indicating that the sign bit is one bit uh, not really necessary here because assuming this number is the right number of bits this will be the last remaining bit anyway but I think this makes it nicely explicit what's going on. Uh, here's another one. Mask the payload with this many bits. And mask the significant with this many bits. And that's it. So now that's the only bitwise and, and now I just have to remember <laughs> to include the helper in all the places where it's needed. So where's this? It's in format. Not so far from where we were previously. Uh, we're in NAN. In finite. So did I get them all? Yes, I did. Uh, so let's say use mask helper in Wasmina float. Um, I just copied this from, is it in the interpreter? Yeah, so at some point we should deduplicate that. Uh, um, okay. Um, I think that I am feeling dangerously content with this now. Uh, let's just read through. Oh, I'll tell you what. It's not in this list, but I should do this. Make the interpreter pass in format, not bits. Um, so I think I should lose this format. Where does bits live? Because that's more, so here this should be format. That's more rubbish in here that that's okay, because this is a low-level helper that is supposed to take bits. And this is the factory that gives you the right one. 
So I think those are the only two acceptable places. And then all of the rest of this, if you want to encode or decode a float, then you just got to tell me what format. And it makes these even shorter, which again, it's not like, it's not like shortness is inherently a virtue here, but like, it means that we've boiled this down to the essence of the task and there's no, there's no fat on it. You know, this is just saying, well, how you encode a float in a, a finite float in a particular format is that you need to tell us the numerator and the denominator and whether it's negated. Well, we already need to, we need to already know that. And the encoding process is we approximate a significant and a binary exponent that will fit within that specific format. Uh, if it's a special one, then we handle the specialness. Um, and then we just pack them into a number. Like, that's exactly, that's the code I wish I could have written, you know, two sessions ago, but none of this code existed then. Um, anyway. Uh, so I have to fix up all the core sites, don't I? Where do we call encode? So this is going to have to... Ooh, uh, um, uh, these all say encode bits. And they're all using... Bits is coming from here. I was going to start putting format equals blah in here, but I think I can just do it here. Format equals wasmina float format for bits and then all of these uh let's make sure it is actually just these all of these encode bits become encode formats so that's actually not very much inconvenience at all and I think if anyone's going to have to deal if anyone should need to deal with that impedance mismatch I think it's the sort of the client of this float API rather than having it be dealt with inside this thing it's pretty low level um, I think those were the only encodes oh yeah okay so here we've got um, something like input format. Like this promote F32 is reading in a 32-bit float and then re-encoding it as a 64-bit float. So I'm going to say input format is wasmina float format for 64 bits. That's a bit, oh no, sorry, 32. It's a bit naff that I'm not just reading it out of the instruction there. Um, but that's what I was doing before. I did remember to do this for decode, right? Yes. Um, and I just need to do the same thing down here. And I need to make it 64 bits, not 32. So there's another piece of tidying up I could do there where I slice it out of the slice it out of the operation. But I'm trying not to get distracted by things that could be better. I'm just trying to this isn't the file I care about. I'm I'm trying to make this file better at the moment. Um so really, I should have left this to-do list item. Oh, of course. I forgot about unit tests. Um, format equals wasmina float format for bits. And then this becomes format. And we're going to have to do the same thing here. So yeah, I mean, this is obviously a little bit inconvenient. But 
worth it for keeping this code as squeaky clean as it's possible for it to be. Okay, I'm happy with that. Oh dear. Right. So I think I can do some more. Oh, actually, I said before that this was a case on exponent, so I'm going to actually make it one. Um, I know that my brand is to use pattern matching here, but actually it's not so good in this case because I have to pin this whole expression. Um, so I'm not going to do it and I don't need it to be exhaustive because I've got an else. So if anyone wants to use this as evidence of me being a hypocrite, then well, go ahead. But I've got a reason. <laughs> um, does that still work? Yes. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I accidentally forgot to commit my previous work, didn't I? All right. Well, it wasn't in that file. And it wasn't in that file. Uh, uh, and it was that. But it wasn't that. Or that. But it was that. And all the rest. Okay, yes, I should calm down. Um, so what is this? Um, pass format, not bits, into decode, well, float decode and encode. This makes the float methods smaller and clearer at the expense of making the caller do slightly more work. Um, float, floats code is more complex and fiddly, so I think this is the right trade-off. Okay, and then, then I can do this. I should have done this case um, straight after doing this. So I'm gonna, you know, well, what I'm gonna do is commit it and then move that commit. Um, replace uh, if else if with case on exponent. In decode. And then that nestles nicely in there. Whew. Okay. All right. I'm feeling better about this. Um, so I think there are still a few more things in here. I don't know why this float regex thing is in here because they live. I'm gonna break out into separate files. I feel like that's not very interesting. I should do that, but it's kind of, it's not even really refactoring, is it? Uh, what can I do up here? I mean, I think extract float class. I think I've sort of accidentally done that as part of all of these various machinations that where my hand was forced by the test. So although, Chris, you had a good instinct in suggesting that, I didn't get to it in time before I had absolutely no choice but to do it. Um, 
so lots of stuff here about oh yeah this use wise men flow everywhere hmm That's interesting. Like I said, that both tidies up this interpreter by making all floats go through my implementation rather than it being sort of like a mishmash of Ruby and me. Um, it also provides more test coverage for my floats. So I think I quite like the idea of doing that because it's going to help me to... It's just going to give me more confidence that it's working right, basically. Um, so let's see how many. Where does where's pack used here? Oh, uh, I can see that this is going to be problematic because I don't support this. Um, I could support that. Oh, this is even more problematic because I don't support this. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, likewise, I don't have NAN and infinite methods. I don't have a truncate method. Okay, well, all of these are just trying to use... Hmm, there's a lot of redundant code here, uh, which makes me not very tempted to touch it. Uh... I think I'm okay. This is not as straightforward as I had hoped. I mean, so the way for me to do this, I think, is at least for now to replace this pack and unpack with uh, decode, Wasmina float decode. But then I'd have to call 2f on it in order to get a Ruby float out so that I could, you know, truncate it. Um,. Likewise, if I had a Ruby float, I can ask it if it's a NAN or I can ask it if it's infinite or whatever. Um, it's actually not. It's actually not hard to do though. I'm just annoyed that there are so many. Oh yeah, there's all of these. Actually though. These ones look pretty easy to deal with, actually. Let's just let's just ta try tackling interpret float because that's this is going to be a hot path for all of the. For all of the floats that we touch. Um, See how far I can get with this. I'm not 100% sure that this is a good idea. Um, was min a float format for bits? Um, also, right. Well, uh, this, this might work. This might work. Um, so here... Oh, actually, this is going to be good because look, this is all repeating work that I've already done. So actually, I think this is good. So yeah, I was a little bit nervous about all this, but actually, none of this is necessary. Because I can just say, float wasmina. This method should live inside float. And in fact, I've got a thing here that says, move interpret float into wasmina float. So I'm, I've started, so I'll finish. So I'm going to keep doing this. But the, fa the very fact I'm even having to type this namespace here indicates to me that I'm in the wrong place. Um, uh, is this right?
because this is this wants to encode hold on am I doing the right thing making a new nan with a payload which is this and a negated which I've already got and then this is expecting it to be encoded this is expecting to get in fact it's going to it's going to re-negate it down here but it's expecting this to be uh, an integer so encode format I think that's right I think all of that is just this let's see uninitialized constant what am I doing losing my mind wrong number of arguments four one two I'm calling two I on nil so what did the deleted how did this work oh it just doesn't it was it was guarded inside nil um let's just stringify it first because uh, I'm doing that elsewhere I don't which I don't like but you know that's how this works um, so I'll be consistent even though I dislike it in fact I should um, oh god depends what which list this goes in depends on when I move it um stop relying on the fact that nil dot to string dot to i is zero i think that's kind of yeah. eg use safe navigation operator instead um but look that that was good actually um i should be able to do the same thing for infinity this doesn't have a payload mercifully just has whether it's negated or not um, uh, this thing well both of these are ultimately going to be finite so this is going to be wasmina float finite dot new and this needs a numerator, a denominator, uh, a negated. Is that it? Yes. Uh, and then this needs to be encoded at the right format. So <laughs> this thing is actually trying to build it's actually building a real rational number. Um, Christ, how does this work? Um, okay, let's start. Um, the numerator... So this is P plus Q times... Oh, but this is in the denominator. Oh, because it's making Q smaller. Um... And then E might be in the this this bit might be in the numerator or the denominator depending on whether it's positive or negative 
Um, yeah, the, sorry. The the problem here is that numer numerator and denominator both need to be integers. So previously here, I was just computing. This is ultimately just a big decimal now. Initially, it was a rational. Um, and all of the, you know, multi raising something to the to a negative power here and the fact that e might be negative or just sort of comes out in the wash in the rational and it knows how to deal with it but if i'm going to be making an uh, an integer numerator and denominator then i need to think about what those things are going to be um So here's, I can't, Q here can't be, you know, I'm making Q a, you know, a float, a floating point number here by multiplying it by, and this is all complicated by the fact that this is all in hexadecimal, but I suppose it doesn't really matter. This is a negative power, so this is going to be a fraction. So I think, okay. So let's just think. If I had, like, I can build this up piecewise, I think. I can say, if I'm just thinking about Q, then the, the parts of this that contribute, uh, the parts of this that involve Q are in the numerator, I've got Q to I. And in the denominator, I've got... 16 to the power of q's length so if it was by putting this in the denominator it's being it is acting as a negative exponent if you know what i mean if it was if it's you know two to the power of five in the numerator if you move that into the denominator it's it's like you're multiplying the whole thing by two to the power of minus five um so the fact that here i'm multiplying by 16 to the power of q's of minus q's length that's the same as dividing by i.e putting in the denominator 16 to the power of q's length and i don't think i need to worry about any of this big decimal guff anymore because it's not going to be a floating point number this is just going to be a large integer which ruby can handle natively so that sort of dealt with the q aspect of it um now i've got the i've sort of got the exponent to deal with haven't i um so let's say exponent equals e to i and I, I haven't dealt with p at all, but I'm just thinking about how do we deal with the multiplied by two to the power of e, where e can and will be positive or negative. So this we have to this this maneuver I just did to put sixteen to the power of q's length in the denominator. I, I have to dynamically decide whether e contributes to the integer numerator or the integer denominator depending on its sign so this i need to know it's absolute i need to know it's i need to know its value as an integer here so that i can say if exponent is negative then denominator and because we're in the land of multiplication well because we're yeah denominator is multiplied by 2 to the power of exponent else numerator so this contributes 2 to the power of whatever either to the numerator which makes the number larger or to the denominator which makes the number smaller so here I need to take the absolute fact because this is an Oh no, sorry. It was it was for this one I need to take the absolute value because the denominator is uh, because the exponent is negative. In fact, I should just extract this expression out. So let's say like scale equals 2 to the power of ex 
exponent.abs and then you know in this case it doesn't matter because it was already positive um, this isn't really doing anything is it So that's accounted for E and Q. Um, so what I need to do, goodness, I remember talking about this many streams ago. Because this P and Q here are like 1, 2, 3, dot, 4, 5, 6. Like this is P, this part is P, and then this part is Q. That's what it means. Um, so I've already dealt with the like the 0.456 bit by saying, well, the numerator is going to be the integer 456 and the denominator is, imagine this is base 10, I know it isn't. The denominator is going to be a thousand, you know, it's going to be the 456 divided by 10 to the power of three because it's a three digit number and that's what makes it express 0.456. But I've also got this one, two, three to worry about. And I think, as I said when I talked about this many moons ago, I think the easiest thing to do is just concatenate these two things so that we get PQ being 123,456. And then when that gets divided by 1,000, that just slides a decimal point into the right place. And that gives us the number we want. So I think this can just be P, Q join to form a sort of compound numerator. Oh, except these both need to be, oh, no, no, sorry. They, I'm just reading off here. They they already get two integered up there. So, oh my goodness, that felt like a bit of a high wire ax, if I'm honest. Exponent. Oh, that's what I was using exponent for, but that's okay because. Oh shit, no, it's not. Okay, well, I was wrong. Exponent was doing something. I need to know whether it's negative. Um. Really, I should just be using the regular expression. It's kind of naughty. One of the things, yeah, I'm going to write this in here. I'm just going to... Oh, I've done this. Make the interpreter pass in format, not bits. Um, I'm going to move all of these into refactoring float.rb if I ever move this method into it. But another thing I want to clean up in here is uh, be more disciplined with matching signs in float regexps because at the moment it's a real hodgepodge of like um this strips the <laughs> sign off the start of the string and treats it specially but then for the exponent it's just relying on 2i like this e just contains possibly a sign and we're relying on 2i to interpret that and then we get a negative number out and now I'm asking if the number's negative and really it would be better if e was always just the magnitude of the exponent and I had a separate match uh, named match that told me the exponent sign and I could test that directly here but I don't uh, so that's something to deal with later so I'll say uh, e.g. have an exponent sign uh, named group uh, in the regexp and use it in during parsing. Uh, use it to decide whether the exponent goes in the numerator or denominator. Okay, um, oh, but hopefully this, I actually want to see this work. It 
does work. Cool beans. Well, um, I suppose what I've ended up with here is actually a little bit more complicated than what I started with. Is that true? Surely not. Hmm. Well. Oh, I don't know. I mean, Ruby was doing all the work for me here. And then Big Decimal was doing the other part of the work for me. So, like, I'm doing all the work now. But I feel better that this is going through the sort of single point of success <laughs> that is my that is my float implementation. Um, so I'm just thinking about how to deal with the fact that this all this code is basically duplicated. Um, I think the answer is yoink. Uh, and then I just need to adjust this. So this significant is in base 10. The, oh, everything's base 10 here. Even the, even the exponent is base 10. Well, there's mm, a sort of a radix and the base. <coughs> uh, does that work? Yes, it does. So I think I am actually gonna. I'm now that I'm looking at the now that I'm looking at this interpret flow. I can see that there's a bunch of low hanging fruit here. Um, so I think I'm going to focus my attention on this probably for the rest of this stream and just try and get this into a slightly better shape. Ooh, hold on, I'm not done, am I? Because now I shouldn't be, I shouldn't need any of this. Um, and I shouldn't need this. Because it, my encoding already deals with whether it's negated or not. Um, So I don't need to assign this to anything. Because this conditional just returns the right thing. Really, I feel like this should be, the format should be passed in, but I'll, I'll deal with that in a sec. Um, okay. Yeah, I think this is I think this is an improvement. Um so this is use yeah. Use wasmina float in uh interpret float. Um let's make this uh Oh, this is not in a place where we already had it, but that's okay. So does that work? Sure does. Okay. Uh, pass format not bits into interpret flow. So I'm going to say this method really belongs on wasmina flow in the first place. So let's get it right from the start. Um, all right, I think I am going to move this and I suppose all of these regular expressions um, because it clearly doesn't belong here. Is mask still used here? Oh yeah. Okay. 
Uh, anyway, that's sorry, that's a distraction. Um, so where should this go? I guess near decode. I've got from integer decode. Yeah, let's stick it in here. And I think I'm, I'm just gonna do the thing that I've wanted to do for a long time, which is rename it to parse. Um, because that's what it does. Uh, so we can get rid of all of this. That's just nan. That's just infinite. That's just finite. That's just finite. I mean, these regular expressions are unfortunate. Sorry, just a second. There is some spam in the live chat. Um, okay. Uh, Uh, is there anything else in here that was that needs to be fixed up? I don't think so. I think that's fine. See that even this error message says can't parse float. So let's just be honest. Interpret integer. <laughs> let's interpret float that I want. Okay. Wasmina float dot parse. Oh, please work. Perfect. Okay. Move interpret float. Well, this is interpreter. Oh, this name is terrible. To wasmina float dot parse. Whew. Great. Okay, well that's a relief. I feel like I've sort of extricated it from where it was stuck. Um, so there are several things going on here that I don't like. Um, So these are, these live in here now. Let's pause. Um, I'm thinking about this, be more disciplined with matching signs in flow regular expressions. Yeah, well, the first Oh, I've just realized something. This whole method should just return a float. And at the moment it's returning an encoded integer. So actually, if I, this doesn't need to know the format at all, I don't think, because that's only being used for the encoding. So it should be possible to remove all of these Because previously there was no other thing that we could return from that method. It had to return a number. But now we've got these nice instances that represent floats. And then we just have to make sure that the caller, whom is in here, knows what to do with it. So parse that string and then encode it in the right format. I think that's much better. Yeah, that's great. I really like that. 
what we what was previous i was just looking at that i was confused about why we even have the format and it's it's completely incidental to what this method is doing we, you don't need to know the format to parse it in fact you may wish to parse it once and then encode it multiple times in different formats um that's totally fine you don't need to reparse it so um uh, move encode out of float parse uh, we don't need to know the format at all to parse the flow so we shouldn't take it as an argument before wasmina float existed we had no choice but to return the flow encoded as an integer because we had no other way of representing it but now we can return a wasmina float instance instead great so yeah i was i've got several problems with this method there's there's a huge bit of duplication these last two cases are duplicated um but the the specialness of the sign handling bothers me so i think i'm going to do this in a couple of stages firstly I, I think each branch of this conditional should be self-contained as far as possible. And at the moment it isn't because we've got this special thing that asks whether the string starts with a minus sign and then it deletes it if it is, well, even if it's not there, it tries to delete it. And I think that it's just weird that that's outside of the scope of these regular expressions. There's no, not really any good reason for that. Um, However, if I want that to be the case, then I need this to be a regular expression match. You know, this needs to be match equals infinite regexp. Because what I want is for this to be, is for there to be something inside here that's like, oh, negated is uh, match uh, sign equals minus, right? Uh, and I can't do that without a match. So I want to be able to do this. Um, I'm going to need a very simple infinite regexp, which looks like, oops. So this needs to look like string starts there's an inf in there somewhere, string ends, but before that, there's, well, actually, what I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? I want to do this first. <laughs> okay, well, that's clearly already broken. What have I done wrong? That is how you match a regular expression in Ruby. Not just using equals. Can't parse float inf. This is an extended regular expression, so please ignore all of the white space. See, this is exactly why I need to take things in such small steps because there are so many silly mistakes that I can make. I was, I really shouldn't have been trying to run before I could walk there. Um, introduce infinite regex so that all float types have their own regex. Um, I'd like to be able to retrieve all information necessary, all necessary information from the match data object, e.g. whether uh, the number is negated and for that to work in this uh, in the case of in uh, uh, 
positive in inf and minus inf, I need a regular expression. Okay, so now I can think about how do I achieve the thing that I wanted down here, which was uh, match sign equals minus. And I think the answer is that I just, at the beginning here, I need to have uh, plus and minus, oops, um, I need to capture this, call it sign, and then the whole thing is optional. Yes, I would, in general, although it would be convenient to have I'm thinking about what's the difference between the group not matching and the group matching an empty string. So if I put a question mark there, then this group will always match and it's just that sometimes it'll have an empty string in it. And sometimes that's convenient and there are places where it'd be convenient for us to do that in the other regular expressions, but the problem is we can't. Like there are situations like this where the whole thing that's optional is the decimal point and whatever comes after it. Um, but the, it's got a match, it's got a named capture group inside of it and same with the, oh look, here's the exponent sign that I was talking about. So because we can't in general just make these match an empty string when they don't match, because here, this, if there's no dot, this named match, this named capture group doesn't even get an opportunity to match, so it's always going to be nil. So I think it's easier to everywhere communicate the idea that the part of the number that we were, the optional part of the number that we were looking for isn't there, means that there's a nil in the, in the match data, and that's what will happen if we do it this way around. So I'm going to do it that way around. Um, so I've actually done what I said I would do. Yes. Does it work? No. Why doesn't it work? Oh, <laughs> um, because we're removing the, because we're removing it. Um, okay, well, I'm going to have to do it for all of them, and I, I, I'm going to have to stop removing it here. Stop catching it there. And... Um, you know, do, do this sort of thing. Make it so that all of these... I mean, I know this... I know this is actually creating more work, um, but I think it has the benefit of regularizing this implementation, that everything that you need to construct this comes from this, and previously that wasn't the case. I think doing, I mean, this underscores thing, I have to think about separately, but doing as little preparation of the string as possible and allowing the regular expression to actually separately as far as possible match out all of the important parts of the number I think it is an improvement here um, actually having figured this out I suppose I can just whack this in there and there and there so does that work yes okay so what is this um Yeah, Tekken, I, I assume that you are uh, 
you, te Tekken, you just said, surely you shouldn't remove it before the match, or I've just seen you say that. Um, I think maybe you said that before you saw me realize why it was going wrong. <laughs> so I'm sorry I've I independently sussed that out, but you are you are right. Um okay, so what's the change? Uh yeah, match sign explicitly in float regular expressions. Um, I'll add a bit about my motivation here. Uh, this makes it so that the regular, that the match data object contains all the information we need to build the float, which is uh, easier to understand and reason about. Uh, that's a little bit subjective, but I think that's probably true. Um, okay, well, the other problem we've got is this duplication here. Um, I think I can solve this, though, um, because... Oh, look, shit, I forgot to take this out. That's not good. Um, oh no, it was all the way back there. Oh no. Okay. Oh no, it was even further back than that. Okay, so it's this, it's this one. And then I think it's gonna, f I'm gonna get a merge conflict anyway, so I don't need to explicitly edit that one. Um, sorry. That was quite the oversight. So I did not mean to leave these two lines in here. They are no longer required. But unfortunately, I did it a few commits ago, so we've got to work that through now. Uh, I'm hoping I get a merge conflict here. Yes, because, well, actually, everything you've got there is fine on the deletion side. Um, and then on the addition side, I just need to redo this. Okay, that's fine. Cool. Cool. It gets good, isn't it? Get good. Um, what was I saying? What I was saying was, these are both the same, except how they're different. Um, they are different by the radix here is 16. And what I mean by that is the sort of, I would use the word base, but this is the base of the exponent. Um, and here, the radix is 10, and the base is also 10. So this is that base 10. This is the radix, and this is the radix. Um, and although this, the radix that the exponent is written in is 10 in both cases, I would also be tempted to extract that as, as well, because otherwise it's just like a weird magic number in a, in, a, in a sequence of code that otherwise doesn't have any. So that's how that works. So they're both the same now. And, well, let's commit that. Um, 
set radix base and exponent radix is explicitly when parsing finite floats. Um, this makes the hex and decimal float cases almost identical. So now we can combine them. Because that was the only difference between these two formats. And so what we can do, I think, I think that you can ask a match object which regular expression it done it. Is that right? Yes. So a match data object remembers which regular expression matched it. So what that means is up here, we can just say that. So we can make this case do both. And then we just have to do the right thing here. Um, I really want to do a case statement, but I can't because you can't put a regular expression in a case without it trying to be all regular expression-y. Um, so let, just, let's just think about this. I think there's a better way of doing this actually, but let's. this is the simplest thing that will possibly work. I just wanna see this work. So I can combine these, I can get rid of this entirely and just say, well, now I've got a single case here. Right, that's good. Um, I think what I would like to do is like, Um, what I'd like to do is get this as an, as an extra argument from here. So I'm going to imagine that I have something like this, uh, finite or like match finite. I don't know if that's not a very good name, is it? Um, and then I'm just going to say, you know, parameters go into radix, base, exponent radix. You know, if I, if I had that, then I sort of need this metadata on top of the on top of the actual match data to be able to actually decode the contents of the is parameters a good name? It's a bit vague, isn't it? Um So I'm just thinking what this helper will look like. Um, so this is just a string. Um, well, I guess it's just this. Um, Yeah, I think I can, I, I could just store all of this in a hash or whatever, but I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna go with this for now. Um, so this is gonna return match and radix is 16, base is two, exponent radix is 10. And this way, it's just gonna be all the tens. to close my arrays. 
that's I think that's gonna work. In fact, yeah. Oh, you're not allowed to do this, but that's what I was about to say, is that I think even though you can't do destructuring assignment like that, you can do this. If match finite in match parameters. And then that made me realize that I actually don't even need to name parameters here because I can just inline this assignment here into this pattern. Oh, that's interesting. That's given me an idea. Okay, that's cool. So I think that's a little bit less clumsy that rather than having to do it inside here, I've just got a little, I've got an assist from this helper that's, I mean, actually this is silly now, isn't it? It should just be this. Um, there's no, no reason for it to... Now it knows which regular expression it is. So I've sort of factored out the... Factored out picking the right regular expression there. Um, I think I, I'm just thinking about the name of this because all of these things are like nan regex dot match infinite regex dot match. I feel like this should be finite maybe regex match hmm. yeah i think that's okay i mean this is this is getting a bit clumsy isn't it but I think that's okay um, maybe there's a nicer way of doing this oh well, I could just do this, couldn't I? Oh, no, I can't, I can't. I was gonna say I could iterate over them, but I don't have a data structure that's got these in. Maybe that's, maybe I need to pull these out into a data structure, but for now, I think this this is an improvement because I've been able to, what have I done? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's actually quite a lot of change, but I think that's, I think that's fine. Um, so I'm gonna say uh, combine, uh, hex and decimal float parsing cases. Um, these only differ in the radixes and base. These only differ in radix and base, so we can use the same code in both cases and just use a helper method to tell us the right radix and base to use uh, depending on whether it's a hex or a decimal float. So I, I said that this gave me an idea and the idea which it gave me was that it would be really nice. In fact, in all of these cases I now see but I was thinking specifically of this one, if we could just say P, Q, 
Q, E, um, sine, wherever, whatever else we're pulling out. Yeah. I guess it's like sine P, Q, E. That would be really nice. And in order to do that, uh, we are going to need match data to implement deconstruct keys, which it does not. So you know what time it is. It's refinements time. Uh, module uh, match data like match pattern mm. that doesn't sound very I, c I can't think of a good name for this, so it's going to be that. So this is going to be refine match data. Do uh, we need a, an implementation of deconstruct keys? And I think that takes an array of keys. So, but in case it's not clear what I'm doing here. Oh, is it a fuck? This is this is going to be in Ruby three point two. I did not know that. Bug one eight eight two one. Thank you. Uh, bugs. Ruby, <laughs> I can never remember what these URLs look like. Um, ooh, thanks Brandon Weaver. Oh wow, okay. I agree with match data. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, well, that's fantastic news. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to write it for now. Um, well, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, great. Okay, well, as soon as I'm sure I won't have finished this project by Christmas. So as soon as Ruby 3.2 comes out, I'm going to uh, bump the Ruby version to 3.2 and remove this refinement. But for now, so I was explaining before I got excited about what Ifuk said. Um, to use an object in a hash pattern to map to make an object compatible with a hash pattern it has to implement this deconstruct keys method that gets called with the keys that are used in the hash pattern and it has to return a hash with as many of those keys as it as it feels like um so in this case what that means i think it's called named captures returns a hash so I can basically just call named captures but I'm just going to need to slice out the keys that I'm interested in oh, on the... I hate it when Ruby does this all of the this is completely unnecessary for these to be strings I'm going to have to I'm going to have to okay well here's what I'm going to have to do I'm going to have to so self is the match data so I'm going to get named captures and I'm going to transform keys to be symbols. Uh, oh, but ke the keys argument could be nil. Okay, so here's my captures. If keys, then captures.slice keys. Uh, that's the wrong kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Fook's saying you can call deconstruct keys on the named captures hash. 
does that work? Like, will that symbolize the keys for me? Well, it, it doesn't, but maybe that's... Mm. I'm a bit skeptical of that. Um, let me try this. I, I want to get it working, and then I'll, I'll come back and... I'll come back and take out the transform keys thing and maybe just call... I mean, I guess once I've transformed keys, then I can I could call deconstruct keys on it, right? But, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm basically done. Like, I've got it. I've got the, I've got the hash I want. Um, let me see what happens. So this is just going to give us a hash uh, containing all of the named capture groups. Um, and they're going to be symbols, which I think they need to be in order for me to match them against symbols in my pattern, which I want them to be. And uh, we just need to make sure that we're, in general, slicing out the right gubbins so that's my refinement and then where do i want to use it well i want to use it here i don't understand why they don't have method scope for refinements but nobody seems to like them anyway even though they're really good <laughs> um so if i've got that in there then i believe this can be sign P, uh, P. Oh, why can't I type Q, E? So for now, I'm going to have to keep doing this. Again, I'm sort of shimming the change I've made there. Oh, that's a good thing that just happened. <laughs> Uh, that's that should have happened. A. Hey. All right. So where are all the places that I'm using matches? Because now, this just becomes uh, in sign. Uh, that. Oh, and this also has a payload. Here's another to string to I that I should uh, dispatch. Uh, I'm going to do this incrementally just to check that I haven't overlooked anything. Um, boom, boom, in. So this has just got a payload. No, just got a sign. I knew it had just had a something. All right. Okay. Uh, I've done that one. Oh, that's it. Sweet. All right, so, oh my goodness, how does one explain this change? Um, something like, um, deconstruct match data directly in pattern matches. Float paths. Um, I do have to, well, refine match data to make this work. But Paracycle pointed out that Ruby 3.2 will probably contain this anyway. So 
So what's the... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand whether this is actually going to go in or not. Like, is there a... Uh, CSV. Uh, oh, okay, no, you're right. So Kazuki has merged match data, deconstruct and deconstruct keys. So I think, I, I think I'll actually link to this. Yeah, thanks a folk. I think, I think this, the stream has probably got quite a lot of lag on it. Um, but yes, here indeed is the merge PR. So I'll link to this. Um, so I don't understand how I don't understand how features get into Ruby 3.2. Like, is the fact that this has been merged into master mean that it's going to be in 3.2? Or does it just mean it might be in 3.2? I don't know. Well, this makes it look very much as though... Yes. I think I'm going to take the probability out here. Um, so I'm happy for it to live here for <laughs> until Christmas, at which point I'm sure I'll still not have finished this project. Okay, that's great. Um, oh, I was complaining, now that I'm in here, I'm tempted to do something about the exponent sign. Like, where's my to-do? Yeah, be be more disciplined with matching signs, and I I have done that uh, with the 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 significant sign, um, but I haven't done it with the exponent sign. So let's do that. Let's say that this was exponent sign. Um, and by the way, I just want to point out that this all that faffing about with the refinement and stuff i think is making this it is really nice like i'm finding this really quite easy to read now so that's good <laughs> um so exponent sign if i had that then crucially that means that this exponent is now just the absolute value of the exponent so it now no longer serves any purpose there. It should just be there. Because you can't tell if it's negative by looking at it, because it's not negative, it's just a magnitude. So this exponent negative needs to be if exponent sign is minus. Maybe I should be, maybe this minus magical string that is cropping up all over the place should be well, either it could be in a constant or maybe there should be a helper method. Um, you know, add negative sign helper method uh, to just do that, make that decision in one place rather than scatter it all over the place. But I don't have that yet. Um, so this is actually, I was complaining, I think you were on the, I think you were watching the stream at the time of folk or you were in the chat. Uh, uh, this is when you tagged in Kevin Newton. Um, I was complaining about the fact that named capture groups... Oh, yeah, because it was you, Afuk, who pointed out that when you use the equals tilde operation on a regular expression, it assigns some local variables. And I was bemoaning the fact that pattern matching doesn't meaningfully support that. And so uh, you really have to choose between am I going to use a case in with a pattern 
with, with a regular expression, but then have to use regex last match or actually repeat the match so that I can get at the match data so that I can get at the named captures um, or just not use case in. Um, and it feels like this is, although I still think they should pull their finger out and fix that, I, I think that this is actually a reasonable compromise like which I hadn't thought about before until I found myself matching part of the result of this method and part of it was some match data. It sort of didn't occur to me that you can do an ersatz version of a case statement by having this if in, else if in, else if in. And then at least if you've got deconstruct keys on your match data, then you can, you don't get local variables for free but maybe it's better that you have to explicitly list them out like this. But I do actually, I actually think this is kind of cool and I've never done it before. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have experienced that here. Um, what the hell was I doing? Oh, exponent sign. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is simply a matter of moving this out so that E is just the exponent and then saying that this is exponent sign. And I think in the spirit of everything else I've said, we make the whole capt named capture group optional so that if there isn't one, this will be nil, which doesn't matter in this case actually, but nonetheless, it's good to understand the semantics of what it is that you think you're doing. So I think that's it. I'm expecting the test to pass now. Yep. Okay. So this is um, extract exponent signs separately in float parse. It is not, I should have used R instead of E. For my muscle memory, it just always types E there. Uh, okay. Oh. Wouldn't have had to continue if I'd that, made that a reword. Okay. Um, great. So I think that, oh yes, okay, so I've done this, be more disciplined with matching signs. I was sort of annoyed about this because I think this obscures the intent of quite a lot of this. It's weird that I'm calling to string on things that are supposed to be strings. So ideally, I would sort of banish the use of to string in these in these two places um but i think that's easily done like here i can just safe navigate so i can say if payload is not nil then it must be a string that so this is like if the if the payload was there in if if that if the part of the float syntax that is the payload was present then please call to integer on it otherwise let's just use zero and so i'm now no longer this or zero is no no longer implicit in this light. Well, just smash it into a string and then it so happens that we'll get zero out of it. Like that felt very uncomfortable to me. So I, I, I do prefer that. Um, does it work? Have I correctly remembered what the safe navigation operator is? Let's find out. Yes. You know, this safe navigation operator is a classic opportunity for someone to say, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be using nils. You should be using some kind of null object pattern, to which I say, I agree. Um, make it so that match data doesn't contain nils. <laughs> but it does, so I'm afraid I have to deal with it even if I don't like it. Um, so here... 
So these already get implicitly converted into strings by join. So there's not really anything I can do about that. I mean, if I wanted to be super pedantic, I could, you know, make, I could sort of detect nil here, but that's, that feels like a step too far. Like, Yeah, why am I okay with that and not with the not with the other way of doing it? Like it's sort of relying on the same bit of behavior, isn't it? Um Yeah, I don't know. I'm just again, I suppose I'm just a hypocrite. Um Oh, and E E is problematic, isn't it? So that's because that, that was getting mapped to string up here. So that's, we're going to have to be more explicit about what the, what the default behavior there is, um, which I guess is zero. Well, it, of course it is because that's what, that's the part of empty string to I that we were relying on. Um, I don't know if those parens are necessary and that's why I'm putting them in. Um, Q is the other problem here because we need to tolerate nils there. And I suppose this is, we're going to be in the same situation where we want that to default to zero. Um, that line's getting quite long, isn't it? Not necessarily getting much value out of that, um, putting numerator and denominator on the same line there. Um, anyway, let's see. It's not that long. I think maybe that's okay. Um, right. I'm quite happy with this. So I think I'm going to commit it. Um, So what am I saying here? Uh, use safe navigation instead of relying on nil to string to i in float parse. Um, it's much more explicit to say what value we want to use when part of the syntax is missing this does happen to be zero in each case but it's much easier to realize that when you can actually see a zero in the code okay i'm gonna i'm gonna go with that I mean, fundamentally, I'm ha I'm unhappy about this whole situation about smushing these strings together and then using the length of the string. Um, but I can't immediately think of a better way of doing this. You know, really, the taking the length of Q is a proxy for taking the log base, whatever the radix is. Um, cause I need to know how many digits it represents in this concatenated string. And it would be much nicer if I knew that log, cause then I could just multiply P by it and then add it onto Q rather than concatenating the strings and then turning them into an integer. But pff, life's too short for all that, isn't it? I'm nervous about taking a... Uh, basically, I'm I'm nervous about taking a log at an arbitrary base is what it comes down to. Um, so I think I'm just going to leave it for now and not lose any sleep over it. Um, make pars generally less of a huge mess. Well, I, I think I have done that. I think that's what this is. Um, it's nearly time for me to pass out. Oh yeah, the integer method. What you mean instead of 2i?
converts arg to an integer, numeric types are converted directly. Yeah, because of the lag on the stream, I'm not sure exactly what your what this is relevant to a fuck other than just re I suppose replacing. Oh, I, uh, maybe what you're suggesting is that um, it doesn't matter if it's nil if I pass it into the into kernel integer. Um, but I don't know. I don't think that solves my. At the time when you said that, I'd just been complaining about this numerator and denominator joining arbitrary base logarithm thing. Um, and I don't think kernel integer helps with that, but maybe it, maybe it does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so to just regularize the handling of nil, yeah. Um, well, I think I've... I think I've taught myself into the idea that it clarifies the implementation to be explicit about these zeros. Um, I might change my mind on that, but at the moment that's my gut feeling is that that's actually a good thing. Um, so I think, just looking through this, um, is there anything that I find objectionable in what remains? I mean, you know, nothing is so perfect. But, I mean, obviously the regular expressions aren't great. Um, yeah, this code could be better organized in terms of, like, what is where. Um, oh... <laughs> Actually, that gives me an idea. I think maybe this, I don't know why this is in this order, but I think maybe it's a bad idea for it to be in this order. I think maybe we should, when we're trying to parse a float, I think maybe we should try and parse it as like a number before we look for things like nans and infinities. So mainly for clarity, but also nebulously for performance but I don't care about performance but this I think this will incidentally make parsing slightly faster in general is if I put this up front first try to match it as a finite float and then I mean what's more common out of nan and infinities it's probably this way around isn't it there's probably more nans than there are li literals than there are infinities in the test suite and I think probably the same is true for this. I really messed that up. Um, you know, I think that I think most of the floats are probably in decimal format, and then occasionally you get a hex one. But this is really I'm really scraping the barrel now. Um, so I'm just going to say match float syntaxes in a uh, starting with the most likely ones. Um, but that's mainly so that when you read this method, the first thing you see isn't like a weird edge case. Um, and also I think it makes sense to try and match the floats before the hex floats. Um, I would rather like to put this in a data structure, but that feels like low, low payoff. Um, let's say move uh, finite regex parameters into a data structure. Like I could, I could just have a hash that contains those. I don't need to have a conditional. Um, Yeah, I think this is good. I think I've squashed all of the weird magic numbers and, you know, thing, 
things that it wasn't clear what they were. I think everything's got a sensible name now and you can understand what each number is. Um, so I was just going to, what I was thinking was before I wrap this up, I was thinking I might take a second run at that. You know, let's, because the, the, the reason I ended up on this in the first place was because this was one of the, one of the places that was still using Ruby floats. Uh, oh, sorry, it was using pack and unpack, which is using Ruby floats. Um, and there's a bunch more of them here. So like, let's just give it a shot. The reason I find this appealing is because it will because it will provide so much more test coverage of my float implementation if I can if I can wire up these instructions to it. I'm already getting a fair amount from the fact that all of the parsing is going through that now, but I think this would just add a little bit more convincingness. Um, so what's this saying? This here is a float. I think. Um so what I would be trying to do is to replace this because I, I, I'm not going <clears> to, <throat> at least not right now, implement this truncate operation on my floats, which is basically two integer. This is going to convert the float into an integer. <clears throat> by just throwing away the fractional part. Now, I definitely could implement that. In fact, I think I know how to implement that. But that feels like a separate problem from the one that I'm trying to solve right now, which is just at least syntactically removing pack and unpack from here, even if I end up moving it into the into my float class for now, which I think is what I'm going to have to do because this for this to work, I'm going to have to say wasmin a float decode value at this format, and then I'm going to need to be able to call to f on it. Is that how decode works? Yeah, and I think I'm, oh, am I even using the right, oh, this isn't even a, this is an integer operation, so I definitely don't have that format available. Um, so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, well, for now, let's just say 32. Because that, you know, it was hard coded before in this pack and unpack uh, implicit, and the L and the F means that it's the 32 bit float. So I've, this is not making it any worse. Um, but it is worse in an obvious way, which is that I don't, I haven't implemented to F. So this is not going to work. Okay, so it's that conversions it failed on because I'd rather just run the one that's... Okay, so let's just think about that briefly. Um, so I think there are two ways that I could implement this, right? I could do the maths... Um, well, I mean, I could just do the maths. I could just do numerator divided by denominator. Um, is that a problem? Because I was going to say the temptation here is just to call in code and then pack it, and then unpack it. So I already know how to represent this float as a 32-bit or a 64-bit number. Um, so I could just do, encode it as a 64-bit, you know, encode format uh, double, and then 
pack this uh, D unpack one Q oh it's the other way around pack it as that's an integer and then unpack it as a double oh why is it not seeing oh it's inside format right which is something that I went to some trouble to arrange So that does work, uh, amazingly. No one's tried to call 2f on anything other than one of these finite flows. I mean, this I could just copy or I guess uh, mix in to all three of those classes. Um, what happens if I do numerator to f divided by denominator? Like, does that also work? No. Why is that? Oh, it also needs to be negated. Um, well, let's just do the simplest thing here. I'm worried about. I'm just worried in general. I mean, I, yeah, that does work. Maybe that's a cuter way of doing it because then I'm, then I really am avoiding pack and unpack and all of that messy business. Um, Yeah, I mean, ideally, these I wouldn't, these wouldn't exist, because I wouldn't ever need to. You know, I could do all of my operations within the world of the Wasmina floats, but then that's going to mean implementing every single piece of floating point arithmetic, and I I don't know that I've got the stomach for that. Um, um thinking ahead, though. I'm going to need to do this conversion in the opposite direction as well. And I'm not sure if it's possible to do that without using pack and unpack. If you give me a Ruby float, how the hell do I turn it into a numerator and a denominator apart from packing it into a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer and then reading the exponent and the fraction out of that encoded data? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of imagining a future problem, but, you know, in this case, it happens to just be calling truncate, but what if it was adding two floats together? Like, I can call to float on both of them, add them, but then I need to turn them back into a Wasmina float in order to be able to encode it correctly. So I need to, I need this to work in both directions, and this this approach will only work in this one direction. So... I think what I'm going to do, and also it's going to be quicker, is just, you know, include to float. Uh, include to float. Include to float. And then up here. Just put this. And now they'll all have that implementation. And now I can just do something like this. I mean, I, I know that all I've done here is just hidden the pack. Um, but at least it's now like tripping through this encode function. So... I do get a little bit more coverage of my code in this way. And I think it is a meaningful difference that now this code that is a client of it is completely insulated from 
any of this i mean all this knowledge about what about the format strings being l and f and stuff like that is just i don't want to have to see that in this interpreter code i would much rather just be able to talk about you know my float format is 32 bit and i want to decode one or i want to encode one i think that's i think this is a more meaningful abstraction for this interpreter to, to rely on. So I think even if all I'm doing is hiding this detail, the fact that I'm hiding it behind a more meaningful API is an improvement, I think. Um, so what's this? This is also 32-bit. Um... So this is result equals, is this, does this work? I just realized I should probably run all of the tests. Okay. Um, I fear there's gonna be loads of these. This is why I've got a, I should have done it the other way around. I've got this remove duplication in trunk instruction implementations because this essentially the same code copied and pasted about eight times. So I am now being punished for that. Um, okay, trunk F64S must be the same as trunk F32S. You know, that's another advantage is that previously I would have had to change more than just the number 64 here, but now I know that it must be the same. Likewise, trunk sat F64S must start the same. It's just 64. Okay. All right, going okay so far. Trunk F32U. Well, it's gotta be something like this. Oops. But I think without the unsigned. Uh, yes. It's just this. I believe. Um, there's going to be an F64U, so let's do that. Um, now SAT F32U is going to be very similar to SAT F32S. And sat F64U is going to be very similar to 64S. Oh, this is tedious, isn't it? I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd combined all of these earlier. Oh, well, the, the crime is its own punishment. Uh, okay, well, that's the end of those. Ah, yes, okay. So... Oh, see, this is going to be clearly nicer because I've got a little <laughs> inline lookup table for the cryptic format strings here. But what I need to do is say wasmina float decode actual value format to f provided that the format is wasmina float format for bits, I believe. Oh, hold on. I didn't read what this is doing. <laughs> um, oh, no, I think, sorry, this is doing the right, this is right, I think. I just rushed into it, assuming it was doing a particular thing, and then I had a sudden moment of terror that it was doing something else, but it's not. It's doing the thing I thought it was. Now, actually, this to-do here that says check whether canonical or arithmetic, 
can't actually do on a Ruby flow, but now this is actually possible to do. I'm not going to do it now, but now that a Wasmina flow transiently exists here, um, instead of converting it into a Ruby flow and calling NAN on it, I could, well, firstly, I could imp NAN question mark is a method that I am prepared to implement on my three float classes that returns either true or false, depending on what class it is. Um, but also, having confirmed that it's a NAN, you could actually ask for its payload, or maybe NANs could have a canonical question mark, arithmetic question mark um, predicate on them. I don't think Ruby even preserves the payload of a NAN when you, um, I think I tried this, I think when, you, when I un unpacked one that I'd made lovingly by hand that had a payload, I think it had just it just vanished, it's not even stored. Um, so that is a genuine upgrade in that now this to do is actually unlocked in a way that previously there was just no way for me to even do it, even if I wanted to. Um, all right, pattern not found, pack or unpack. So I guess there are really two changes here. And one of them is this, uh, implement to f on wasmina float instances. Mm. Uh, classes I mean yeah I'll say instances I mean it's a wasmina float is a module but you know what I mean um, I mean instances of the classes within that module is what I mean so now you know what I mean um, and here it's just use was wasmina everywhere in interpreter um this removes the last occurrences of array pack and string unpack from the interpreter which is a big improvement in readability um, at the moment, we've just moved the packing and unpacking into 2F on the float classes because there's no other way. Because I have not yet thought of another way to round trip Ruby and Wasmina floats. Okay. I think this extract the duplication of the float assembling code has implicitly been done by the fact that this method that is now called parse no longer does the float assembling because encoding happens after the parsing. So I think that's that's done. Um, I think that I'm going to stop there um, because I've got a long way. Um, I'm really quite happy with how this float class has turned out. I, I, I didn't I mean, it needs to be needs to be broken up into separate files, and maybe a little bit more. Maybe there's a couple more helpers that could be written that I haven't written yet. But compared to how it looked at the beginning of this stream, I'm actually really happy with how sort of comprehensible this turned out to be. Um, and now I think it is edging into the territory of being something that is. I mean, touch wood. It 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 started to have the feeling of being obviously right. Like in as much as I can, it is easy for me to explain and justify 
pretty much every line of Ruby code in here. Like, I now understand what each of them is doing and why it's there. Whereas previously, even just coming back to it after a day away, it was a... I got a psychic, psychic nosebleed a couple of times trying to understand exactly how... what some of these numbers meant and how exactly this was all working. So now I feel like there has this has actually affected a significant improvement in, like comprehensibility of this code so that's really well that's the best I could have hoped for so I'm very happy that it's that that's come out in the wash in that way um test rule passing that's my that's my little treat um well I think that's it I think it's bedtime for me um thanks very much for watching this as always it's extremely gratifying that anyone bothers to watch me working on this so thank you for either showing up in the live chat a fucking and tekken um and chris zetta um and anyone else who's watching this after the fact i'm very grateful thanks for bearing with me um but for now i am going to try <laughs> before my voice gives out entirely to say goodbye